Rochelle, Philip, Lena. We are ready to come back. Can I get a motion to convene into open session, please? I move that we convene into open session. I'll second that. Great. Roll call vote. Rochelle? Aye. Philip? Aye. Eric? Aye. Janice? Aye. Susan? Aye. Elizabeth? Aye. Ayes have it. We are in open session. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to today's board meeting. Um, do we have any public appearances today, Tish? Okay. Uh, then we will move on to the consent agenda. Can I get a motion, please? No. Oh, shoot, I skipped it. Never mind. Uh, we're going to go to Celebration of Excellence. Um, and we actually have two today. So the first is going to be the MGEF um, to come and chat, and then we'll talk to the Cottage Grove PTO. But we're not doing the consent agenda. No, the Celebration of Excellence comes first. I always forget, though. Okay. It's F. Consensus oh. agenda is H. Ready for me? Yes, we're ready. we are. All right. Ooh, a big chat. Big check, very big, very big check. So um, today, Dr. Frederick and I went to the groundbreaking for the Amazon facility in Cottage Grove, and we got to open a box. And inside that box was a check for $150,000 to the foundation that we will funnel back to the school district. Yay! Tonight. So um, I don't know if anybody was able to see the six o'clock news, but it was on channel 27 for a short bit. Um, and then some of the other stations were there as well. So we saw it on TV. Yep. <laughs> so that's kind of why I'm here, and that's what's going on. Amazing. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Very nice. Very very unexpected, but very good. And yeah. then they also donated one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the Cottage Grove Library. Great. Oh, that's awesome. Both both parties got that. Excellent. All right. Great. Thank you. So, okay. Jason, thank you for your communication with um, Amazon and. Um, being Johnny on the spot when they called. <laughs> yeah. We didn't know how many zeros would be behind that, so it was a super pleasant surprise. It was. So yeah, I knew that there was a I knew there was a five in it, but I didn't realize there was a one in the front. So yeah. That's yeah. it was a good surprise. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. So <laughs> thank, thank you. For, you. Yeah, thank you for your leadership. Well, I'm glad we were able to get there. Yeah. So all right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming, Jason. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, keeping rolling with good news. I think we've got some representatives from the Cottage Grove. PTO, newly re-envisioned, yes, reformed. We don't have a big check for you. Saying, we're we're really you know what? Quick, that. take that take that one and turn it around. <laughs> well, welcome. The floor is yours. Okay. So we were asked to come and talk to you a little bit today about our organization. We're the Cottage Grove Schools and Family Organization, formerly known as the PTO. We rebranded this year um, in step with Winnicott, who was a little bit ahead of us, but thought that was a great idea to be more inclusive. Um, you only have two of the four of us tonight because we had a couple of sick kids and sick husbands. Um, but <laughs> Megan? Uh, I'm Megan Swanson. I'm the president this year. And Julie Rindy is serving as our vice president. Jill Stiller is our secretary. And, and then I'm Jamie Genrick serving as the treasurer. We have a whole new board this year, so that was notable uh, new leadership for us. Um, and so really what we wanted to, with having a new board this year, what our focus really was, was to kind of reground ourselves, not only in rebranding, um, but really wanted to make diligent effort to build more community in Cottage Grove, to find ways that families could be more involved in our three elementary schools. Um, there was a disruption with COVID, but also just some drift over time, I think, in terms of families and school community. And so we really are focusing on um, working collaboratively with our three principals, building really good relationship with them and bringing families more into the fold with our schools. We also wanna support future transitions as we look towards moving towards neighborhood schools in Cottage Grove and what that looks like. Um, I think the future of the Cottage Grove Schools and Family Organization as we know it today is a bit unknown about what that will look like when we move into neighborhood schools, if they'll each have their own organization, if we'll remain as one or what. Um, but that's definitely something that's on our mind and a focus. And then expanding playground accessibility, again, with the neighborhood schools and needing to fundraise and make sure that our playgrounds are accessible for kids at each of their respective schools. Absolutely. Um, so in order to kind of further all of those goals, we have several initiatives that we work on throughout the year. We started the year kicking it off, welcoming back all of the teachers and staff at the three buildings with donuts and coffee. Um, and then Throughout the month of September and October, when the three buildings in Cottage Grove host their parent-teacher conferences, there are different nights that they have them, um, the SFO stepped in and did a dinner meal for each of the staffs. We tried to uh, go a little more old school this year and brought in crock pots of soup that a lot of people donated, and we got some community donations, and the teachers and staff, the feedback was really great. They seemed to really appreciate that. 
Um, a few weeks ago, we had our big fall festival event, which is our largest fundraiser of the year. It was at Granite Ridge. We raised, well, Treasurer, it was about? Just under $14,000 net, yeah. which was in line with what we did last year. So yep. that was great. Yep. Lots and of thank you, attendance. Susan, for coming. We saw yes. you there. It was <laughs> and so buying our candy much bar. fun. Yes. <laughs> and don't take your husband. He was in there doing the craft stuff. You know, that was I mean, what he was assigned to. Yes, that was. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, they are I went volatile. in and bought twenty dollars <laughs> worth of candy bars. <laughs> Appreciate all of it. So, um, so yeah, so that's a really popular event. We, you know, have a see a lot of turnout and are already starting to plan for next year. So. Um, why don't you jump on the spirit wear stuff? Spirit wear, so, that. Yeah. so we're going to centralize spirit wear this year. The SFO is taking it over. Previously, all three schools were kind of running their own programs with their own vendors and happily were, the principals happily handed it over to us. <laughs> so we're working on that. It'll be another revenue generator for us that we can then turn back and support the schools. Um, so we hope to have our catalog out within the next week or so. Also new this year, or kind of re-picked up is restaurant nights. Um, the previous PTO had done this years ago. It had fallen off. Um, but we have one coming up on Thursday, November 21st. If you want to mark your calendars and come out to Noodles in Cottage Grove, they are giving us a whopping 25% return oh. on purchases. So that's great. And another one planned for Culver's in early December. We'll be posting those on our website and Facebook groups for sure. Yeah. And then we have, um, in the past, they've always done a movie night at one of the schools. Um, sometime in the winter, it's completely free and open to everybody. It's just community building. Kids bring in blankets and sleeping bags and crash on the gym floor and have a great evening. Um, we're looking at doing an end of the year picnic. There's a bunch of other ideas that are in the works, especially as we look at our big fundraising project this year, which is um, the playgrounds, like Jamie mentioned, primarily at Cottage Grove School, knowing that the neighborhood schools next year, that one is the one that needs the most attention in terms of being developmentally appropriate age-wise, accessible, inclusive, all those kind of things. So um, we're going to probably be doing other events, restaurant nights, you know, there's talk of move all kinds of, you know, great big ideas that people are having as we're getting together and, and planning for that. So we just have a couple pictures from Fall Festival. There's raffle baskets and smiling children and all kinds of games. Um, we did send out a feedback survey asking for input from anybody who went and got some great comments and some suggestions of things for next year that we're already looking at doing. Um, and yeah, I guess if there's any questions or anything else you were curious about, we're happy to answer it. But Thank you for having us tonight. What questions or comments from the board? I just want to thank you. The festival was really fun. It was. Great. Do you want to give a little bit of an update on the um, playgrounds? Sure. Um, and then where you're at with that. We have a design, and it's going to be revealed next week. We actually have our general um, Cottage Grove School Family Organization meeting on Monday night. It's at CGS at 6 o'clock. All of you are always welcome to attend any of them, because I'm sure you have wide open calendars with no <laughs> other meetings on them whatsoever. Um, we have, we're working with Lee Recreation, who has done most of the other playgrounds in the district, and they have sent us some really beautiful designs. We've actually had a small kind of committee working on it, including a couple of parents who are specifically bringing the lens of accessibility. And so they've helped us out with connecting us with, you know, mobility experts and vision experts, even in terms of the colors that we're picking for the playground that are going to be the most inclusive and the most accessible for all of the students. Um, and so we're really excited on Monday night to kind of reveal the design to everyone and um, get going even farther with our fundraising and our, you know, we're going to do a lot of different things through different avenues. We understand there's a lot of things that the community needs funds for currently. And so we're looking at, you know, businesses, families outside of the community. A lot of grants are also designed specifically for accessibility um, features and playgrounds. So we have some people that are working on that as well. And the SFO has committed $15,000 oh, yeah. towards the funds for playground as well. What is, what is your projected cost? The entire fundraising goal is $100,000. That includes multiple phases. That also includes adding a few more accessibility pieces at Taylor Prairie, knowing that as neighborhood schools that are serving you know, all of the kids in the community, that they should really have similar and equitable um, pieces in there. So the first phase is about 60000 is what we really have to shoot for for September 1st. Other comments? Questions? Just thanks for all you're doing. And I, I'm sure the teachers appreciated the meals. And also, I think it's really cool that you took over the um, spirit wear thing because 
that can be a lot of work. And anyway, it, you're doing work. a lot of work. And I'm, it's really <laughs> impressive. We have a lot of great helpers. So. Yep. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, uh, you know, you talked about kind of, you know, sort of post-COVID and, you know, needing to revive it. I'm just kind of curious with this new kind of integration, rebranding, have you seen an uptick in participation and energy from families? Yes. Um, I think it's, I think we still have a ways to go, but I will say like Megan and I got recruited into our roles as officers because we were two of the only people showing up to meetings. And I'm proud to say that our first meeting of the year, we had a bunch of parents we didn't know that came to the table. And so I think that's a start. We're developing different communication strategies to reach families. Um, and so I expect that'll continue to grow over the year. Yeah, that's great. Well, you, you've been doing an awesome job. I love, um, I, Fall Fest is the best, but also um, you posted that picture, I think, of conferences at CGS with, like, Jesse, I think, standing there, like, yep. demonstrating his soup. No, and, totally candid. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Um, but, yeah, you're doing, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job with visibility. I think your social looks really great. So I'm excited to see kind of where you go this year and kind of how it continues to grow and move. So great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Right. Well, back to where we started, which is consent agenda. Can I get a motion for the consent agenda, please? Motion to approve. We need a motion for the to approve the consent, consent agenda. agenda as oh, I motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. I'll second that. Great. Any further discussion? All right, uh, we'll do voice vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Ayes have it. Uh, consent agenda is approved. Um, next, we will move to correspondence and announcements. We have two today. The first is the notice of election. Do you want to take this one or you want me to take it? Oh, either one. Your call. Yeah, so the school board election is coming up, uh, and per statute, we are required to notice it. Uh, this year, uh, we have two incumbents that are um, will be running potentially for re-election. Their term is up. That's Susan Manning uh, and Peter Sobel. Um, directions for anyone that's interested in running for school board um, are available on the notice, and you can reach out uh, to Tish uh, to help support you in that endeavor. So good luck to everyone this election season. Next up is a community member committee updates. Um, Peter was able, is unable to attend today, um, but I know that Rochelle, you've been working on committee member um, interviews uh, for teaching, learning, and equity. So I'll pass it over to you. I'm there. <laughs> in front of my um okay. So uh, I'll just say that uh, let's give an update. It doesn't have to we be. We had we had five applicants and they were all great and I had a really hard time making a decision who would fill gaps that we had already in our um, committee. And so that's what kind of drove my decision. But um, I'm hoping the other folks who did uh, apply and interview, I'm hoping to have them tap them for meetings that might be in their wheelhouse so they can come and be a part of the conversation because I really want to, um, I think they have unique uh, insights that would be helpful with the committee. Um, and I won't steal Peter's thunder too much, but they did also uh, conduct interviews for the Finance and Operations Committee, um, and those selected candidates have been notified, and we're just waiting to make sure that they have accepted. And when he's here, um, he can give a more detailed update on that, the number of applicants. Um, but similar to what you were saying, Rochelle, um, we had a large number of applicants interested in FNO, um, and so we were really glad and excited to see that level of community outreach. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just jump in, too, because oh, I was... Sorry, you were I was part of all the interviews for that one. And um, I just want to, again, thank all the people from the community who applied and gave up some of their time for the interviews. We we spoke to a lot of really great people. Um, it was a um, you know good problem to have. We had a lot of good candidates, and, and it was a, a difficult decision. Um, but we did get some, some great people. So, yeah. Yeah, Susan. Elizabeth, do we have one of the questions I've gotten, and, and maybe you just alluded to that, is kind of the time frame for uh, so, I think the community members are not as aware of the process. So, basically, they did the applications. The chairs did the um, 
reviewed the applications and interviewed the candidates, and they have have they actually chosen yes. the individuals? All, all individuals have been chosen and notified. Okay, okay. And then when, I think one of the questions was, when will that be made public or? Yeah, so right now we're in the process of sending out uh, all of the letters to uh, individuals that were selected as well as corresponding with individuals that weren't selected. Oh, okay. um, and once that it, those are all out, we've gotten receipt of those things, then we'll be able to post all of that stuff so it's live. I just want to be respectful to the candidates. Um, so we did have a bit of delay because of Peter's um, was working through, he ha had to travel, and then obviously he's got uh, some family things that are happening. So on the timeline, um, we were going to announce the final candidates tonight, and then they have until November 21st to accept those appointments with their term beginning in December, um, and that is on the website. So. Okay. Any other questions about committee appointments? Great. All right. We will move on to our next agenda item, which is Lena. Awesome. The board report. Let me just configurate this. Mm -hmm. best. Okay. Thank you. Me too. I don't know where my, my, my dad got it for me, oh. but um, it's one of a kind, I think. Very cool. Um, so this is kind of a long one, so be ready. The Concert and Chamber Orchestra shared their first concert of the year last week, performing a program that was centered around the art of storytelling. The orchestras incorporated music from many genres, allowing students the opportunity to explore Wisconsin folk songs, jazz rhythms, and the classical era of music. In addition to pieces with traditional stringed instruments, the programs had several songs that involved electric instruments played by the multi-talented musicians. Last week, HOSA organized a blood drive for the Red Cross. With over 82 donors participating, the club exceeded the goal of 57 units of blood collected. By educating donors about the prep period, the operation was more successful in retaining and inspiring future donors. DECA is celebrating DECA month this November, including a spirit week that began this Monday. Today was blew out. The month hosts several community service events, including raking leaves for senior citizens and reading with students at Winnequa, and also encompasses the chapter's first local competition. Officers have hosted several study sessions to ready competitors for the upcoming competition season, which culminates in the international competition in Orlando, Florida in April. That's on there. Model United Nations, a student organization that fosters leaders skilled in debate and political science, was in full swing in Monona Grove's auditorium, cafeteria, and classrooms on the 2nd of November in the form of Mad Mon 15, an annual competition attracting the best 25 and more schools in Wisconsin. Over 500 delegates gathered to debate both serious and fictional issues and write their versions of resolutions in committee. Monona Grove Maliwen, hosting the conference for the second time in three years, blew the competition out of the water by winning 27 total awards, including first place in eight out of 16 committees. Letters of Love, a club spreading words of kindness to people in need, had 28 people participate in their first meeting of the year and created 45 Letters of Love. The cards are sent to critically ill children around the world as part of a global movement. Monona Grove has also welcomed the Environmental Club to the school, a group already at work organizing a used clothing drive. The club is educating students on proper recycling practices and materials by putting up signs over every bin in the building and hosting weekly meetings. Now, several winter sports commenced their season this Monday, including girls basketball, gymnastics, and boys ice hockey. Several more sports will have their first day of tryouts next Monday. Similar to girls tennis, who competed at state and individual state last month, sorry, team state and individual state last month, girls cross country participated at the state meet in Wisconsin Rapids after taking second place in their sectional and conference. The team took 15th place in Division I and had one runner place third at the competition. For September and October, the high school recognized seven and eight students of the month. Their pictures can be seen across from the main office. Among these students, chosen for their exemplary attitude and hard work, is a 10th grader in the special education program. Other students can attest to the work ethic, positive energy, high goal setting, and investment in Monona Grove's principles that this student demonstrates. By making a point to be kind and never giving up on her challenges and goals, this student sets an example of persistence and kindness and is an under-recognized role model at Monona Grove High School. The second quarter has brought about several ongoing efforts to make the school a more inclusive and kind place. 
This month, Monona Grove Coalition started the Kindness Initiative, which poses a daily question on the announcements on the topic of gratitude and invites students to respond. Additionally, the school psychologist and family and student engagement specialist are putting together kindness circles during lunch periods. The circles, which are open to all students, aim to encourage small group conversations about mental health and foster a safe and inviting environment for students to share their feelings. Additionally, my first survey as part of a two-question Thursday series will be sent out to students tomorrow with a focus on mental health. The first of the two surveys in this topic will establish a beginning status on high schoolers' mental health and how the school's focus is received by the students. I'm looking forward to analyzing this data and sharing the findings in the future. So this is what we've been up to in November, and um, I will share more in December. Great, thank you, Lena. Questions thank you. or comments for Lena? I'm curious, uh, all of this information, does it just come through you naturally or do you have an army of you know, yeah. minions who are <laughs> reporting back to you well, about what's going on? Actually, about that, many of these things I was able to just write down because I, I knew about them and had participated in a lot of them. And things like the HOSA blood drive, I'm not in HOSA. So I contacted my friends who are HOSA officers and kind of did some like reporting or some like journalism and investigation. And it was a lot of fun, actually. Um, so that's got more details into all of these events. Well, and you are very modest about not talking about your tennis, <laughs> which was also exemplary. And again, I would just add, I know the football team was devastated. They lost, they beat Menominee here at home, which was a great game, and then um, lost by one point in Rice Lake. Tough. Should have included that, but now, now we know. <laughs> Another day. Another day. I will be really interested to see, like, will you share the results of your survey with us? Oh, yeah. oh for sure. Okay, great. Awesome. Uh, this was great, Lena. I'm really um, appreciative of, like, the large range of things that you um, reported on. I will say um, when the students came to Winnequa to read, my daughter, I asked her how the day was. She was like, it was great. We had high school students come read to us. So tell your, tell your <coughs> friends it made, a, it made an impact to them. Um, it was a great positive experience for those kids and hopefully for the high school youth as well. Um, yeah, And I'm really, I'm looking forward to seeing how the first two question Thursday turns out. Great. Yeah, thank you, Lena. All right, we have a number of discussion items today. The first up is first reading of policy. I'm not sure, Susan or Tanya, if you want to kick us off. Um, so basically what happens, and I think most of you are aware of this, is that Naola brings in, I would say 25, I'm just taking a round number, it felt more like 150, but um, policy changes, and some of them are significant, just massive, and a lot of that has to actually go back to administration for their input, and so this looks like a lot of policies, because this is at least three meetings, maybe four meetings of the policy committee. Um, so we'd be happy to hear any, I'm not sure we can answer all your questions. I actually brought all of our policies that we've done in our notes. Um, but if it's a serious question, depending upon how the superintendent would like to proceed with that, um, we could actually hold that particular policy and review it and bring it back for its final read in the January meeting. But um, we went through these line by line. <laughs> Questions about any policies that are... I do have a couple. Yeah, go ahead. Couple questions. Um, so on policy fifty two hundred attendance, there's two um, uh, letters being stricken. Uh, one related to severe weather, and one related to um, illness of a family member. I was just curious: are these um, covered by other 
items within the policy that are going to remain? Or I just wanted to, to hear a little bit of explanation on. Um, yeah, I think um, the idea of uh, you're excused if someone in the family is sick is a holdover from kind of the COVID era of being put in quarantine. Um, we know that if a public health official says somebody is not able to come to school, that's going to be excused. Um, but I think because we continue to work on getting our chronic absenteeism rates up, we really want to uh, remove options that feel like mm, come to school, not come to school. Um, you know, obviously, if a child's ill or someone in the family has to be quarantined, we're going to um, honor that. Um, the other part about um, you know, obviously, a parent has the right to keep their child home for any reason for up to ten days, um, but I don't think we want to promote that inclement weather stay home day. And then <clears throat> the other one that I was wondering if you could just opine on a little bit is the uh, 5460 related to graduation, um, the impact of striking the GED option or just the the rationale behind well, that. And um, so that's uh, GEDO two, the um, GED option. We don't run a program mm -hmm. and we do, uh, kids do have access to that through student services um, through another policy and it would be students at risk. And so we, it's covered in that, that way. So just to clarify, cause maybe I'm misreading this then are, we're not removing something we already have. This is just indicating we're not adopting part of the Okay, got it. Um, many, the, some big districts run their own GED program. Um, our kids have access to it through Madison College, and that's in the um, at-risk students policy. That, no, that, that's perfect. Thank you. That was all I had. Other questions? I had two that I, had, I have shared with the policy committee previously, but I just want to um, say them out loud so the whole board can hear, um, both regarding... Mm -hmm. Um, 8,500, which is our food services. So there's two revisions in there that I have questions about. Um, one is the fluid milk uh, requirement got struck and not replaced back. Um, and the way that it reads right now, it seems like if so, the way the USDA the, the way the USDA allows it, my understanding through the rule is that if you are using a milk alternative, then you don't need a disability notice. As a, a parent can just request that. The way that it reads right now, it sounds like we're going to request, we're going to require disability. So just want to be able to clarify that. And then the second one is um, some uh, recommendation to clarify some of the language around um, student fees uh, as it relates to uh, the school meals. So right now it's kind of like it's up to $100, but then if you are in in the red, then you still get a meal and and sort of it's, it, it's not 100% clear. So I did offer a recommendation to the policy committee for their uh, consideration and review, and I just want to let the board know that I did that. So we can, um, do you want to go through the changes you made, or Susan, we can take it back to policy? Would you I, prefer? I think it would be fine to just take it back to policy so okay. that we can look at it and make sure that um, if we need to get administrative feedback on that, on that question, you could do that. And yeah, thank you very much for putting that in writing and giving that to us. That was very helpful. Yeah, no, no problem. Happy, happy to do it. And thank you for your work on it. I read through all the policies, and everything looks really great. And um, I do want to draw board members' attention to the slight modifications that were made um, related to the virtual participation. Um, so, policy zero one six four meetings. And so, if you hadn't had an opportunity to look at that one. Um, please, please do so. It's a minor change, but I think worth taking a look at around the expectation of in-person and sort of virtual being exception. And there's some uh, exceptions kind of spelled out in that. Yeah. And by the way, I just wanted to say too, I appreciate the format that this was presented in. This was really nice. Uh, the sort of cliff notes, you know, along with the, the, the differential between existing and proposed that um, really helped, I think, you know, see the intent behind the change and then read it for myself and make sure that that intent aligns with my interpretation. So I appreciate the way this was presented. I agree. Thank you for noting that. Mm -hmm. I, I agree in that. Thank you goes to Tanya who put that format in that, in that capsule for us. And it also allows each of you to see 
um, what the drive for the change was and whether or not it was statutory or just um, just a, a change for clarity, um, which I think is extremely helpful because that's something we all see. Now you can see if you look at that, I'm going to, I'm interested in that particular area. And so I'm going to look and see what the change actually was. We spent a solid hour on the wellness policy this morning. And we could have spent two. That thing's a beast. I feel like you're going to have a lot of feedback. Oh, on I will it. have. I have. I, have a lot. I wanted to go this morning, but I, I couldn't add another meeting. Thank you. 15. <laughs> yeah. 15. Just send it to me and I'll, I'll redline it. <clears throat> it's a lot. 15 pages long. Yeah. No, it's a, that's a beast of a, that's a beast of a policy. But we've been out of compliance for a long time. So it's good that you, that everyone addressed it today. Yes. Yeah. Um, Anyway, I want to bring up policy um, 2340. That is our district-sponsored field trip mm -hmm. policy. Um, one of the changes that we had as a, a committee that I brought forward is that we change the language. Um, if you go under, uh, if you scroll down under general trip provisions, um, the policy had said that the board shall assume the cost of field trips. Um, no regularly enrolled student should be charged for a fee to participate in field trips. Um, and the proposed change is to move the students may be charged for participation in a field trip. No student shall be excluded due to financial hardship. Um, students may be charged a fee um, for other sponsored trips which are not part of a course of study, which is, which is not uncommon. Um, the district has been not charging any families for field trips. Um, it costs about $175,000 a year of the budget. Um, as we talked to the building principals, they felt like that was um, something that um, there was support to shift. Um, I have heard that from parent groups also um, that has continued to come up. Um, we did do, and I'm sorry, I thought it was in here, but I'm not seeing it. We did um, do an um, analysis of what uh, the average cost per grade was for a field trip. And I thought it was in here, and it's not. Um, but I will, I will make sure that that's in here and share that out. Oh, yep, it is. Sorry. It's up under the top. So um, at kindergarten... Uh, 4K, 5K, it's a uh, average student cost per year is $16. Um, for Cottage Grove School, 412, it's 54. Uh, Winnequa, 45 is 48. Uh, Cottage Grove, or Glacial, Glacial, sorry, Granite Ridge, uh, 56. The 68 at Glacial Drumlin, the 37.79, and the high school, 12, uh, $12.08. I have a quick question. Um, when would this go into effect? Uh, it would be um, in effect most likely for the next school year. Okay, thanks. Um, I, I appreciate you bringing this, Tanya. I have kind of two questions. One, given the like pretty large range of field trip averages, will we be thinking about like standardizing that at least across elementary and secondary? And then second question is, would we, would we roll these into student fees or would this, these be standalone for families? Yeah, um, they would be standalone. Um, so it would be based on what is planned. Um, the principals did talk about kind of saying, what what where do we want to cap it, right? Like, do we want to say, like, not, student fees not to exceed mm -hmm. X amount of money? Um, some There's a lot of things that kids do that there's no admission fees for, um, and it's the cost of the bus, which we would continue to pay. Um, and it would be done through Infinite Campus. Um, several of the uh, student family organizations have asked if we can set up like a angel fund. So it's one of those things where if you want to you know, pay for your child and you also want to do $7 yeah. for another student, that you can do that. So that's um, one of the things that um, they would like us to pursue in that, in that opportunity also. Um, obviously, students that um, qualify for free and lunch and have a fee waiver, we don't ever ask their families for money. Um, I think it's more for the families that maybe are um, don't, don't meet that qualifications but have some financial hardships, sure. and how do we uh, be respectful of that yeah. and, and be able to provide that opportunity. Great. Thank you. One quick question. Um, when my kids were in uh, Winnequa in elementary school, that's how it was set up. So it wasn't that long ago that that's how it was standardly done. My understanding was this was a change that was made um, kind of in the 
you know, in a in a time thinking about some financial hardships and COVID and some some implications. I think as we look at our uh, own financial situation. I'm not sure um, that it's something that we would want to continue doing, which is why we talked about it in committee and wanted to bring it forward for consideration. And I will just share that when I was teaching, I appreciate the angel fund when I would send home a note saying we're going on this field trip, you know, here's the fee. Do you need a scholarship? Do you want to provide extra for someone? You know, there were many families who would provide a little extra for someone, so I think that that can really help out. And we can do that through Infinite Campus, so it doesn't, you know, there's not kids having notes come back and forth with that kind of information on it. That's really something that can live between um, the teacher and the family um, to be able to take that um, exposure from kids because we don't, we don't want that. Which is awesome. Yeah, it's also a pain in the butt. Teachers not <laughs> handling money is awesome. I'll just say that. <laughs> Kristen's Thank like, you. yes. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, Eric. Um, I guess just a, maybe a, a question or concern about the policy 5771, the search and seizure one. And I know this isn't really a change, but I think I've brought this up before. Um, the one line that I guess just concerns me is that the administrator shall attempt, again, I know this has been in there before, but the administrator shall attempt to obtain freely offered consent in writing if possible to the student um, for inspection. However, provided there is reasonable suspicion pursuant to the above paragraphs, the search may be conducted without such consent. So I don't, I never liked the wording of that. It's basically saying like, we're going to search you whether you provide consent or not. That's how I understand it. I, I understand, I'm not, I don't have a problem with the searching of the school property and the lockers and desks and things like that, but this is on the person. So I guess I'm just curious what the legal aspects of allowing us to do that are. Um, Does so the school give us special circumstances outside of normal civilians and stuff? Out uh, outside of normal, like uh, we have, uh, law enforcement has to have probable cause. We just have reasonable suspicion. And that's when we can say to a child, like, you need to empty your pockets, you know, or we ask them to open their backpack. Okay. I think there, in the past, there's been some instances that have caused unnecessary behavior incidences because of things like this. I guess that's, you know, in the policy, this is one thing that concerns me. I don't know if there's a way around it or not, but I do kind of see it as a violation of individual rights, even though they're in the schools, because it's on the person. And then, you know, we're leaving up to an administrator to determine what the suspicion is. And that is what really worries me is that we have an administrator that's now going to determine if there's suspicion, like what does watery eyes count as suspicion? Does someone that's not walking straight count as suspicion? Like what are those areas of suspicion that we're... Yeah. Normally it's um, uh, another student has reported or there's been a visual of that there's been um, someone saw something. Uh, Mitch is with us if he wants to come and talk a little bit about how this plays out in day-to-day -day life. Well, I don't know. I, yeah, I guess, Mitch, maybe you don't have to go into it. Maybe just tell us if there's been any issues with this in the past, in your experience. Okay, that would be my that that was my concern. So we're this isn't happening just because there's been one thing. This is you know, okay, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Rich. Do do we have any method of recording how often this occurs too, so we can kind of have an idea? Um, anytime a child is there's reasonable suspicion and and a search is conducted, that needs to be documented in the child's file and everything that was found or what was there. And sometimes it might be nothing, but it might be, you know, there was a gum wrapper, there was this, that those things are um, put there. And so that we have a record of that. So that would be on the individual I, student level, right? I think you're asking yeah, about the aggregate. Yeah, just generically if we have an idea of, of how often it happens. I mean, I think it's, I think it's necessary in the day and age we live in with, weapons possibly coming into school. I don't. I, I want the school um, people in charge to have the uh, ability to do that. But 
Um, I'm just curious, you know, as a parent and a community member, if it happens very frequently. It's not weekly. No, it definitely does not happen very frequently, um, especially where you get to the point where um, you're exercising, uh, as the policy says, uh, we are going to search the student regardless of consent at that point. Um, I can't think of a situation since I've been here. And I, just just to clarify, you know, no one's putting their hands on kids if it gets if they're like nope and they're not going to empty their pockets. You know, that's why we have school resource officers. Um, we have other than that, just kind of ups the escalates it to a different different level. We're not going to take that on ourselves. Thank you. Yeah, yeah follow up too. Does this does this particular uh, as I'm thinking about it, right? We have an entire district. The high school is the obvious, I think, place to focus on, but. Um, with the smaller kids and the younger kids, um, does this come into play, but in a different way? Um, where, you know, where maybe the, I'm just trying to imagine like a, a first grader consenting or even understanding, you know, I'm, I'm assuming it's a, it's a whole different situation at that point then. Usually that's, you know, I think when we have, when we talk about kids having like reasonable suspicion of something that usually sounds like they maybe had something on them that they were showing other kids on the playground and other kids have come forward and said like, Hey, so-and-so's got a knife. And yep, at the thinking, end of the day, it's yeah. a, it's this big and it's a little Swiss army knife and it, a keychain, And so, you know, that usually sounds like, do you have anything in your pockets? Like, what do you have? And kind of same thing. Yeah. I, I just wanted to kind of make the point that it's not just high school kids we're talking about. It's and and I would certainly expect a principal at a elementary school to have the authority to <laughs> find that pocket knife, you know. But yeah. Other questions about this or any other policies up for consideration for first read? Lena, you look like you're ruminating on something. Do you have anything you want to add? Um you don't have to. You just had a thinking look. I was just thinking about um, graduation requirements. Is that in the student handbook? Requirements? Yeah. All of it? Okay. Thanks. Oh, the whole policy? It, it's, just, I know it, it's referenced in the student handbook. I don't know. And there's a, probably a link, like a live link. Yes, there is. Okay. Thank you. That's it. I'm worried. <laughs> Lena. <laughs> Lena's like, I could have graduated three years ago. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, can I just say thanks, to Susan, again, and the policy committee for, you know, keeping us up to date and everything. Appreciate it. Okay, next item up for discussion. Um, I think, Kristen, you're coming up for the 2024-2025 enrollment report. We did not bring the podium back for you, apparently. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Um, oh, we have a clicker. Thank you. As we talked last month on uh, regarding the budget, we uh, one of the key pieces of information we were waiting for uh, for the budget was enrollment in the third Friday count. And so tonight, I hope to um, review that thir third Friday count and go into some a uh, little bit of history on the district's enrollment. <laughs> uh, so as of the third Friday, we had 3,672 students sitting in our seats compared to 3,696 last year, so a decrease of 24 students. Again, these are students actually sitting in our seats, so they could be resident students or open enrollment students. As you can see from the chart, uh, the largest increase was the high school and largest decrease was at Winnequa. From a history perspective, this chart shows open enrollment in the light blue and residents in the dark blue. You can see that we um, have increased our open enrollment numbers over the course of these past six years. Our enrollment has been fairly flat, an increase from you know, 22, 23, but if you look at 1920 where we had 3,124 residents um, and we have 3,138 residents today, our resident enrollment is fairly flat. Resident enrollment is key for our funding. Um, that's what we count on our revenue limit. So it's important to um, identify those resident students. 
From an open enrollment perspective, you can see that increase over the year. The light blue is pupil transfers in, and the dark is pupil transfers out. So those are resident students attending other public schools. What happens with the funding for this is that we get about $8,900 for um, open enrollment in students, and we pay $8,900 for open enrollment out students. Um, obviously, we have a large um, net increase to our revenue for that. It's just about under $5 million. Um, and um, we do also pay out that $8,900 for those pupils going out. We do get to count those pupils going out in our um, revenue limit number, so those are why we keep track of that as well. This chart just shows you by grade uh, what, what we have in terms of resident and open enrollment. Uh, largest class sizes, as you can see, are at the high school, but we also have uh, some of the largest open enrollment students as well. From a projected versus actual perspective, we projected about 37 more kids than we're actually um, sitting in our seats, 4K through 5 this year. Largest discrepancies in the early grades, 4K, 5K, and first grade. From a class size perspective, we did show this chart at the budget meeting. We are um, within our goal in all grades except for 3 and 5 at Granite Ridge, where we are just over um, barely, but all well within our range. From a 612 perspective, we were just eight under our uh, projected versus actual. And in total, uh, we were about 45 um, less students than we projected at that 3,672. Um, our building capacity district wide, so adding um, capacity at every single one of our schools, we have capacity for 4,459 students. That's based on the 2017 study that Vandewal did for the district. Um, so just giving you a comparison about our capacity versus our um, enrollment. We'll also do this by um, school, so you can have an idea um, of our capacity. Taylor uh, Prairie has a capacity of 388. We had 264 students. Um, we do are breaking it down by resident students and open enrollment students so that you can see at 4K and 5K, we have probably at least one classroom um, full of open enrollment students. Uh, Cottage Grove, um, we have room for 200 more students there. Granite Ridge, uh, capacity of 703, currently at 470. And Winnequa is the, what, the one building that's closest to capacity at 602 versus 644. Uh, Glacial Drumlin, 962 versus 766. And the high school is another um, one, uh, or second closest to building capacity. And then we have our MG21. I didn't have capacity numbers for that, but uh, we have 93 students there. And that was it. Any questions? What questions do we have for Kristen? Yes, go up. Uh, in terms of the, you know, like I, I saw that Winnequa was one of the ones that um, had the biggest gap. Um, do we have enough data or any data to know if that trend will likely follow as the uh, as the classes move through the the schools, or do we expect, is it impossible to know whether people will move in with a kid, you know, and add them to that class in middle school and that sort of thing? Can we, can we use it to project the middle school and the high school? So what I'll do for the five-year forecast is <coughs> do like a five-year cohort um, to project enrollment, and that'll give us an idea by building, by grade level, sort of where, uh, what we can expect. It's not a perfect enrollment forecast, um, you know, I'm not taking into consideration birth rate or housing um, starts, although there's not many housing starts in the Monona Grove area, or the Monona area, more in the Cottage Grove area. So I don't uh, anticipate, if you think about Winnequa, a large fluctuation just because we're, it's pretty landlocked and, and developed. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but we'll have more information at the December um, Finance and Operations Committee with that uh, forecast. Uh, that includes enrollment. Thank you. And we, we do have the enrollment projections from 2017. Um, I do think that those will be good to bring back also um, to see what was what was projected and kind of where we were or where we are, I should say. Yeah, Marshall. I'm, I'm just thinking one consideration, and I remember in 2017 when 
they were building the new school and kind of that whole conversation about Monona. But I'm curious because I'm seeing all of these um, condos and apartment buildings. And um, the when when we were asking at that time, they were saying, um, well, you know, families don't tend to live in condos, so they were not included in the projections. But I wonder with the cost of housing, if we'll see a change with that. Um, so Chris and I have met with the village of Cottage Grove, and we've had those conversations about what are the projects that are already approved and what's coming. Um, everything that's on those dockets, there's two-bedroom apartments, which typically don't bring you families. Um, and the price point of those rentals is quite high. And so I, I think it would be, you know, when you're looking at, you know, $2,600 a month in rent, um, I'm not sure uh, if that is, that that typically isn't what's going to drive families. And then some of the price points of some of the housing subdivisions that are going in are, are not garnering a lot of children either. Um, so I think when people look at that we're flat or slightly declining enrollment, people are a little perplexed by that because you drive out there and it feels like there's dug up dirt everywhere, but it's not necessarily the kind of um, housing that is going to bring us families at this point. And that's the same for Monona too? I'm just thinking how we're getting, I mean, it's, there's lots of building happening. Right. I think it's the same type of development where at this point in time, but you know, I, it, you have bring up a good point in terms of, you know, there's a lot more renting happening than um, buying new homes just because of the price point. So we'll just have to keep, you know, monitoring that and having conversations with the realtors around the area. Yeah. Yes. I think at a previous meeting when we were talking about like, why are some families opting to open and roll out I think maybe you had mentioned like doing a survey. Are we thinking of doing that this year? Um, so that will be uh, one of Katie's tasks is to um, reach out to families who are OE'd out um, to have a conversation just to, to get some fact information about what, what drove their decision um, so that we have a little bit of a un better understanding of the why. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? I have an open enrollment related question for you, Kristen, which is, um, you know, as we're thinking about um, open enrollment students are revenue generating for us. And uh, when you have more students, that requires more capacity, right? More staffing, more building. So obviously building capacity is not a challenge, but staffing is a challenge. And so um, I'm just curious your perspective on how we balance out declining residential enrollment or stable residential enrollment, which is not good for our financial forecast, with, I think, a potential idea or temptation around increasing open enrollment numbers and kind of how, how do we balance those things out? Yeah, typically you want to use open enrollment to fill open seats so that you're not pushing it to add a whole nother section. We're already at that point in some grade levels, so that's something that we should look at for future years um, about what our strategy is going to be. Part of that will be, you know, what is our forecasted resident enrollment and um, our open enrollment moving forward and, and the costs associated with that because, you know, sometimes you can look at it just in a vacuum and say, okay, it's one classroom and um, you know, 20 kids in a classroom times $9,000 pay for that teacher. But there's other services involved in that um, in terms of um, uh, there may be special ed services or um, you know, uh, social work services. It just, it, it, there's a lot more involved in that. So it's just something that I think as we plan forward, we're gonna have to look at. You know, obviously $5 million, we don't wanna, <laughs> that's, a, that's a huge chunk of our budget that that would be hard to just, you know, pull away. But I could see a gradual strategy of kind of right-sizing things so that we're actually filling in um, seats rather than full sections. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, Lena. Um, financially, is it better to be, like, are we, do you want to be at capacity or do you want to be slightly under? You want to be at capacity, yeah. Fill them up. <laughs> Other questions? Thank you, Kristen. 
All right, next item up for discussion is um, to take a minute to reflect on 4K Wrap Care. Uh, for those of you who have been on the board for a little while, you know that this was a program that we added a couple of years ago um, at Taylor Prairie to help support families. Um, since 4K programming is only partial day, um, this allows uh, families to have a full day worth of care um, at the same space. Um, while, you know, juggling other types of things like work and those things. And so Tanya um, is going to give us a little presentation on how it's been going and kind of the future of it as we think about uh, moving to community schools. Um, so it came up when we were talking about Fund 80, which is where this lives, when we were doing the uh, annual budget approval, was what what was it looking like from a um, gener reno renovating, mm, generating revenue um, and also just enrollment and staffing and things. So put together some information. So we do 4K wrap care um, at Taylor Prairie. It started in 22-23, um, and it supports the families that are in wrap care at that building. Um, and so that has, so currently is serving 53 students. And what that looks like is in the morning, there's 28 students that are in wrap care. And then um, during the lunchtime, they are all together. So then there's the 52. And then in the afternoon, it flip flops and there's uh, 28 students in the after, uh, or 25 in the afternoon. Um, so there's that 1030 to 1130 time where it's it's everybody. Um, the students do participate in our lunch program if, if families so choose. So that is available there. Um, we do staff that with uh, 4.5 FTEs. There is a director, a program coordinator, um, kind of oversees, you know, um, the staff and and what kids are doing. Um, Emily Foster, you know, obviously is the administrator in that building, and so she's there from an administrative lens. And um, we do the program coordinator, two providers, and then um, 1.5 FTA of uh, EAs. Um, in contrast, 4K at Winnequa is serviced by um, the Monona Park and Rec, and they rent our Maywood building and provide that service. Um, and then. Uh, before and after school care and other um, buildings um, in Cottage Grove provided by the Y. Um, so it is the only one that we provide, which I think um, begged the question of like, what is that What is that doing from a, from a revenue perspective? Are we breaking even? What does that look like? Um, so um, I did attach the uh, yearly budget projections and actuals. So in 22-23, uh, it was about $44,000 in profit. Um, the following year, 23-24, um, it was $50,000 in profit. And um, this year, it is expected to be about $13,000 in profit. Um, the, and that has been based on increasing staffing. Um, so, you know, has been profitable, still breaking even. So I think the model has um, been successful from a financial perspective and we've been able to staff it. I think what this does tell us that we do have to think about is um, in the neighborhood school model, we're not going to have new 4Kers. We're going to have the same amount of 4Ks. Mm -hmm. They're just going to be in two buildings. And to replicate these services in two buildings would probably be cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. So I think the the correct thing that the team will need to look at is what, what does that look like? Much like we do now, like for our kindergartens at Taylor Prairie, if they need extended care after school, they take a bus over to Cottage Grove School. Mm -hmm. um, and we do that busing back and forth. So that probably would be the best solution, um, but we still need to dig into that a little bit more. Questions? Yeah, Janice. How do the 4K kids at Winnicott get to Maywood? Oh, they come and get them and walk them across the street. Okay. Cool. There's a little parade. <laughs> it's, it's quite lovely. Yeah. It's a little 4K parade that yeah. goes right across. It's, it's great. There's some other, yards there. there's some other uh, after 4K programs in Minota that do. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Bus dropping off the little 4Kers. Yep. So there's um, several daycare community providers that provide also, and we do, as long as they're in our boundaries, um, we do drop kids off at those sites um, through the busing. And they used to do that at the community center before Maywood? I'm probably not right. No, this is the first year that the city's been offering. What's oh, the, the first year? Okay, for the 4K. Yeah. Okay, not the yeah. after school. Not the after. They've done the after school. Yeah, I'm thinking of the after school. Yeah, not the not the 4K wrap. Yep. Um, I have a question about the document, Tanya. So, um, there's two right hand side columns. That's 24, 25. One's the revised budget with profit and. One is fiscal year activity at a loss. I'm just curious, what is the difference between those two columns? <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, well, 
one's the, what we're projecting, right? And the other one is like how much money has come through already. Um, I think, I, I'm assuming it is that um, tuition hasn't been added. Kristen, would that be correct? Oh, hmm. oh, sorry, I asked another question again. So, Kristen, on the last page of the document around wrap care budget, there's two fiscal year 24 25 columns. One is around the revised budget, so that's projections, and then one is the fiscal year activity. One's operating at a small profit, the other is operating at a loss. I'm just curious the difference between those two. It's just the timing when the revenues come in and the expenditures go up. Got it. Okay, so we don't anticipate, we anticipate it'll generate a break even. Modest, a modest profit, we'll call it. Every penny counts, Daniel. Right. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, have you discussed this, or have you been in discussions with the building <coughs> around kind of what options will be? And yeah. So part of part of the drive of looking at this was exactly that about what is the feasibility of running two separate programs mm -hmm. and getting the numbers. And so that was this. We've discussed that. Um, we meet once a month um, as a team to talk about all the different little nuances about the neighborhood schools. And so this has been one of them. Um, to have that conversation. So our next our next thing is to talk to um, Nelson's because we'll have to do a midday route okay. there and back, um, which, you know, now we do afternoon routes. Those are already happening, yeah. so that's not an ad. So it would be that midday route. Okay. Um, and have you thought about or talked about um, seeing if, like, Cottage Grove Parks and Rec would be interested in picking up or the why? We have. I think that's, um, you know, I think the first question was, are we breaking even or operating at a, um, some revenue? Or if um, we're going to expand programming, would the Y be interested in a park and rec? So also a conversation. Um, we also did talk to the um, child care providers in Cottage Grove about their willingness to, just like we bus kids in Monona, to those child care mm -hmm. providers, if that's something that they would be interested in. And, and three out of the four said if, they, if there was busing, um, they would consider it. Okay. Um, we do want to try to make some decisions relatively soon. Yeah. So as families are making those decisions about 4K, um, because it is a mm -hmm. choice, not a um, compulsory education issue that they they really know what their options are, what the cost, the price point is, and so they can make good good decisions for their family. I mean, yeah. we want them to come to us, but we also know that um, there's other options, and you know, parents make those individual choices. Then you'll continue to kind of explore with the building principles and then come back to us with the yes. proposal. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Any other questions about wrap? Um, all right. Last up uh, for discussion is the Wisconsin Public Education Network membership. Um, a little bit of context here. Um, back at April in our reorganization meeting, um, you all recall there's like a series of things that we vote on. Um, the newspaper, the lawyers, the banks, all of the things. This was one of those items. Um, Dr. Frederick had received an invoice uh, earlier in October, um, and given our financial situation, um, declined the invoice. Um, and so recognizing that there's a difference between what we talked about in April and what's happening now, uh, we want to be able to have a discussion around how we feel about that, um, whether or not we're comfortable and okay with that, or whether or not we would want to... Um, pursue uh, Wisconsin Public Education Network access for this year. And the total cost of that invoice, I think, was a little over $1,100. Mm -hmm. 11 and change. Yeah. So that's, that's the context and history for this conversation. Yes, Susan. Uh, I'm under the impression that the um, a, a donation for the fee has been made. Did I haven't been in my office all day, so oh, oh, I haven't I had enough. Okay, so I'm I'm just, yeah, making a face because I'm. <laughs> I know, I know. She can't open okay. her mail. So uh, well, anyway, we'll so, investigate that because I think that that resolves itself, right? Yeah. What? It's my understanding that. Um, <laughs> Probably. Yeah. It's easier than trying to give back your salary because you can make the donation to the district. And um, I, I know that um, Susan Fox and I started going to Wipen years ago and learned so much. And um, 
I just think it's an opportunity, particularly um, with the loss kind of of the funding for the WSB meeting, mm -hmm. which, again, was an incredible educational opportunity. Just the conference, not, not any WSB. The conference, meeting. yeah. Um, so if, in fact, a donation has been made, um, are we in agreement that it's okay to go ahead and pay that fee, and then we can still have that membership available to the board. Oh yeah, curious other board member perspectives on that. As long, I, I mean, that'd be great, right? And it, certainly thanks if that's the case to whoever made the donation, um, as long as it's through the proper channels and done the right way. And uh, I mean, why I would have no problem with that at all. Other board member? I don't know about it yet, so, right, so yeah. 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 <laughs> it doesn't even. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, I think that would be amazing if the um, WPE and Ferry has delivered us money. I feel very strongly that we should be in it because they are one of the groups that were the most uh, crucial in helping us pass the last referendum, which without we would be even in worse shape. So like, I really feel like we should be in this membership because um, they helped us get where we are now. And they're also really good advocates for, for public education. So like, if I really feel like it's a thing that that's important for our district because they've helped us in the past and will continue to do so in the future. Rochelle or Philip, any thoughts? <laughs> if, the, if this has been taken off the table for us by somebody being very generous. Yeah, and I think looked at it differently. The board already voted to be in it, so we don't have to do it again. Really, we should vote to not be in it if we think we should go that direction. So. Great. Yes. And just to address that point, I didn't know it was voted on in April. And so when I, you know, lately when I get those kind of invoices, I'm like, no, no, thank you. Um, so I apologize for that. I didn't um, realize that that was part of the resolution that was done in, in April. So appreciate the grace. If the check goes through, right. <laughs> Great. Well, we'll um, circle back on that. So I think, Tanya, we don't have to have another agendized item on it unless... Um, for some reason, that donation did not come through um, or came through in a, in a way that uh, does not, to Eric's point, go through appropriate channels. And then you can just give us the update in your um, confidential board report when you know. That sounds good to everybody. Great. That resolved itself. Um, all right. Action items. Uh, the first item up is the 2024-2025 Certified Staff Collective Bargaining agreement, which I know that Eric and the personnel committee have been working uh, really diligently on. Um, so Eric, I don't know if you want to start by giving kind of an overview. Sure, I can take this and then maybe Kristen, if people have questions, you can answer them. Um, uh, first of all, there's we did switch with the personnel committee. So I am the, the new chair. I want to thank Philip because he was a part of this too. So um, uh, together we all uh, Hope that we have an agreement. I'll just go over it with everybody and then you can ask questions. So um, just uh, to review the Board of Education Administrative Representatives work leadership from the Monona Grove Education Association to come up with an agreement on annual base wage increase by law. This increase was based on a CPI, which was 4.12% for all collective bargaining units um, beginning July 1st. Um, so uh, we originally offered uh, a 4.1 increase, which is number one. That's the first one on there, certified staff move one step, plus the 1,514. We discussed that as a board in a closed session meeting. Um, then there was another offer, counter offer to that, uh, number two, certified staff remain at the current step, receive a 4.12 increase. Um, and then after talking with Minnesota Grove Education Association, um, the personnel committee is recommending the third option, which is the certified staff move one step, $1,100 plus 2.56% per cell. This was an alternative option that was presented to us. Uh, mainly because it uh, is better for the top of the salary and our veteran teachers. Uh, all three of these are within our budget. And in fact, the uh, number three option is a, 
I think, a couple thousand dollars less than the 4.12%. So after speaking with the personnel committee, the personnel committee is recommending option three. Certified staff move one step, $1,100 plus 2.56% 2 per cell. Uh, we feel really good about this offer. Uh, we also, in addition to that, there's a little caveat that uh, we are um, committed to working with the Memorial Grove Education Association because we would have to make an adjustment back on the salary schedule in the next bargaining session. Uh, but I think all parties are committed to um, make that adjustment and, and work on that. So for now, I think this is the best option and I'm really happy that we came to this agreement. There is a tentative agreement only on option three. So the board needs to understand that as well. Uh, I can try to answer any questions or Janice can try to answer any questions or Kristen's here too, so. Questions? Yeah, can you, can you just um, expand a little bit on the last comment you made about the adjustment back? I'm not sure I totally understand. Yeah, so you mean the difference between uh, the third option and the first or second one? No, the... You just oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, future. yeah, yep. Um, cells out of balance? Yep, because it puts the cells, the steps okay. in the cells out of balance. It's like, that, that, that it's by sense. a very small amount, but it is an amount that... No we, longer an even step is what you're saying. Yeah, Chris, and I don't know if you want to answer that. You could probably answer better than I can. We just have to clean that up at some point. Yeah, and I, I do want to say my Grove Education Association is aware of that, and I, and I have a written um, collaborative, you know, agreement that we're going to work together to do that. So, oh, thanks. Just wanted to make sure I understood that. Other questions? I just I don't have a question, but I just want to say I'm really glad that how hard you guys worked. I mean, it it sounds like you guys came to an agreement with our staff, and um, people are feeling fairly good about it. So, thank you. Yep, and Peter's in agreement too, even though he's not here. So, <laughs> right. uh, well, so then I would need a motion for that. Yeah, so, um, yeah, could I get a motion to approve the 2024-2025 Certified Staff Collective Bargaining Agreement to move one step to $1,100 plus 2.56% 2 per cell? I'll move as presented. I'll second that. Great. Can we do a roll call vote? Oh, sorry, any further discussion? I would just, before we vote, I just want to also uh, extend gratitude to the staff from the MGEA who spent a lot of their time as well uh, working through this with us. We had a lot of really good meetings, a lot of really good discussions, and I know Eric picked it up after I stepped out and, and took us right across the finish line. So I just want to thank, thank uh, everyone on that side of the table too for all the effort. Um, it's, uh, it's really nice to be able to collaborate on these things, especially in the, the kind of year that we're having and the challenges that we're having. So really appreciate that. Anything else? All right, roll call vote. Rochelle? Aye. Philip? Aye. Eric? Abstain. Janice? Aye. Susan? Aye. Elizabeth? Aye. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Next up is the 2024-2025 revised extracurricular slash additive schedule. This is also personally the Eric show. Uh, wait, where <laughs> are we? The Eric portion of the agenda. Uh, the revised. This one's about orchestra, I think. Extracurricular? Yeah, the additives with orchestra. I'm let Janice, do you want to take this yep. one? Uh, I will take this. So uh, we heard a presentation from the orchestra department, um, and at the high school there are two directors, two instructors doing the same job, and one was being paid as head orchestra director and the other one was getting paid as assistant, and their request was to just have – orchestra director. So we are getting rid of assistant orchestra director and we're just going to have orchestra director and both um, both orchestra teachers will receive that same additive. And I believe there's a, an additional additive around GSA at the elementary school? Yep. Um, and that is, so there's a GSA at the high school and at the middle school and so then this just adds a GSA um, at, uh, instructor person at each school because Winnequa had one um, and Granite Ridge had one. So I think we're adding it at those two schools. Any other changes to the additive schedule or those are the two that we're considering are today? All right, can I get a motion please? 
I move approval of the 2024-2025 additive schedule as presented. Second. Any further discussion? Okay, roll call vote. Rochelle? Aye. Philip? Aye. Eric? Aye. Janice? Aye. Susan? Aye. Elizabeth? Aye. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Uh, next up, the 2024-2025 Certified Staff Handbook Revisions. Uh, okay, again, uh, I want to make sure I thank Philip because we were both working on this together, um, even though I took over, but these are all things that were has been in the process of the personnel committees working on. And one of the things we did this year was to try to um, address some of the handbook revisions in our meet and confer meetings. So these are the um, first ones that we thought we were able to present to the board to vote on as changes. This is an ongoing... Um, this is going to be an ongoing discussion that we have in our meet and confer meetings, so there likely will be more that we bring to the board in the future. Um, so the ones today um, are on the orientation, uh, where the association shall be given one hour, one half hour before or after lunch, and the lunch period on the agenda. It was previously the last 30 minutes time period. Um, the other one is sick leave. Uh, where we add physical and mental health condition. And then there was a catastrophic sick leave bank um, where we're adding impacting the employee, the employee's spouse, and the employee's dependent. And then for professional compensation for IEP meetings, teachers assigned to attend IEP meetings outside their normal of work shall be paid at a rate of $32 per hour. Did... Do you want to talk about that one? I'm just, is, is that where we're at? Is it, was it 32? Is that the correct amount? $32 an hour is the... Compared to 16 where it was before previously. Yep. Um, and I think then the other thing, so currently how it reads is teachers assigned to IEP meetings shall be paid at a rate of $16 an hour. So currently we're paying um, teachers extra duty pay during the day. Um, to attend IEP meetings. So this change would make it so, um, obviously it's an expectation of employment. Um, you know, it's, it's just what we do uh, for students. Uh, it's part of our planning and preparation. But we do know that if they're outside of the school day, obviously we would, we would definitely want to compensate anybody that was working outside of their contracted day. And I believe we discussed this as a board too. So this is that, that, that same thing that we discussed, so. I'm just going to say that I think that um, this isn't, however, where we left it in in uh, meeting and confer, and I would be way more comfortable if we brought this back, this one thing, the IP meetings, back to a meeting and confer so that we could talk the, with the teachers about this. Section, the section 2510. But the other ones. The other ones yeah. are great. And, and this but is, this isn't, it's just not where we left it. And, and I don't want us to vote on something where we haven't like had a full discussion with um, the MGA about these changes. Philip, maybe you could talk a little bit about this because I think this was more you on your side that when I got, before I got involved with the IEP discussion. This, this came up, as I recall, during the, the last meeting that I, I chaired. So I think we started the conversation. So I, I probably, don't have anything more to add than whatever you guys talked about in your most recent meeting? Because I think you've had one meeting. Since yeah. So I, I would say that previously, and I don't know the exact date, that we made this change. Um, it was probably before everybody except Susan was on the board. Because <laughs> I think it was me, it was me and you and Peter and the other board members. So um this previously, um, the way that it's right now, where teachers that are teaching, special ed teachers that are teaching have an IEP meeting during their day, um, we're not getting the compensation for doing the IEP meeting during their normal work hours of the school day um, because it's, it's typically part of the job of a special education teacher. Um, and then that was, we added that in because we thought it was, you know, uh, not only an expectation, but a, a legality that they had to do and it was potentially taking away time from prep time and their other duties. Um, I will say as a special ed teacher, it's, it's typical that that's not the case in most districts. Um, 
And it certainly is is justified outside of the normal work day, like if you have to have an IAP meeting outside of after school or before school starts. So, and that's what this is saying. So really this is saying that we're taking away what is not there now so that if a special education teacher, correct me if I'm wrong, has an IEP meeting at one o'clock and they're at work at one o'clock, that they fill out a piece of paper and then they get compensated for doing that meeting. And if you're a regular teacher, same thing. So, so that's the discussion. Now, Janice, I mean, you brought up a point. I don't know if you want to elaborate on the, and the reasoning of why or the benefit of why that needs to stay in there, but for the rest of the board members. Well, because, so, I mean, it opens a can of worms that's a larger can of worms about prep time and the use of prep time um, for things like meetings, but it was expressed that when people are attending different meetings, they, you know, have to give up the work that they would do in their prep time. And so then that work becomes an outside of school work. So we're offering to pay people for a meeting that's outside of school, but really it's just bumping people's work from during the day when they would do it to outside of school. So the meeting happens instead of the work that they would have been doing during the day. So that's kind of a, a capsule of this. Yeah, I would I would say a counterpoint to that, Janice, and I, I appreciate that, is that the the point of a IEP meeting is to like provide and prepare for instruction for that student. And so I I I don't think that it's true to say if I sit through an IEP meeting, I'm not prepping. You are, you're just prepping for an individual student and their specialized plan, as opposed to prepping for your entire class. And so while I appreciate wanting to protect prep time, and I 100% agree with that, um, I would argue that this is prep, it's preparatory time, even though it's a meeting, it's still a time to to prep. In the same way that I assume that our teachers, when they're co-planning meetings, like that's part of their regular business as well. I'm going to make a suggestion that we uh, vote on these separately. And we vote on um, 3.05, 8.02, 8.08, um, as as one vote, and then separate out the section twenty five twenty five ten as another vote, and split them. I can get behind that if folks are comfortable with that. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, can I just make an, a point um, for the twenty five ten? Um, I I agree with you, Elizabeth. That I and I I've been a classroom teacher, and um, I was fine giving up my prep time to have meetings to hopefully set up all my students to succeed better. And that's what an IEP is giving you that opportunity to kind of know individually what's going to be successful for that kiddo. Um, and I also think that 1650 to meet and do an IEP outside of school hours is it's pretty sad. So I think that 32 is a lot more real reasonable, even though that's, we value our teachers and they're worth a ton more than that. But I feel like that's at least a little bit more fair nod to say yeah. you're coming in and this is really uh, appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, go ahead. Um, so we did pull um, the certain student services admin assistant schedules all, most of all the IEP meetings so we can see it's rare um, that we ask people to stay after school for a significant amount of time. It, you know, best intention is like a half hour. Worst, you know, we get to an hour, hour and a half. Um, it's not the norm. Um, that I think they, you know, the case managers work really hard to try to keep that within the workday. Um, obviously, we have to do it at a mutually agreeable time with families. And so sometimes, yep, early in the morning or after school. Um, and so, yeah, we want to be able to acknowledge that that could happen. Um, I, we, I was also asked what's the cost associated with this. Um, last year, we paid about $20,000 in extra duty pay. Um, so while people were getting their regular compensation, they were getting this on top of that. If we made this change, obviously, that would double that. So we would be, you know, getting into the $40,000 a year exposure for this um, one part. Um, just to clarify, too, um, around other, like, meeting times. So in the in our handbook, do we have compensation for, not for co-planning meetings, what about other, like, DEP meetings, for example? Mm -mm. So it's just specific to students with disabilities. 
But I think that in and of itself is a inequity also that we should think about and consider. <clears throat> so I'd just like to clarify, though, the thing that you said about doubling it. To, so making this change is not going to make it be forty thousand um, dollars. No, and it was first proposed um, when we got it in it, the exchange. Um, at the point that I was brought into it, the outside of their normal work hours was an addition that was made from the districts on end. It, the first proposal was teachers assigned to, to attend IEP meetings shall be paid a rate of thirty two dollars per hour. So the initial ask was to get paid during the workday and double the rate, and then. The response back was, can we increase the rate if it's outside of the school day? So I okay, I would just Please, ask us Janice, to not vote on this. Well, hold on, because Janice. We, yeah. Let, let's, I want to make a motion without that so we can, we can get that, and then we can go back to discussion, if, if that's okay. Because sure, I, because I think it's important to have that discussion, oh. and also... The, there is um, not consensus on that with the personnel committee either, so I want them to know. But there is consensus on the rest. So, yes. so I, I'm going to make a motion um, to approve the 2425 certified staff handbook revisions as 3.05, 8.02, 8.08, and that's it. I'll second that. Any further discussion on those three handbook items? Okay. Hearing none, we'll do a vote. Uh, Rochelle? Aye. Philip? Aye. Eric? Aye. Janice? Aye. Susan? Aye. Elizabeth? Aye. Ayes have it. Motion carries. That leaves um, the last item, which is the 25.10 IEP meetings. Um, I will say I'm in favor of this change. I think it makes sense for all the reasons that I've already laid out, and I would be interested in voting on it today as opposed to sending it back to personnel. Well, I think someone should, if wants, if someone wants to vote on it, they should make a motion. I just, I do want to, uh, we can go to discussion after that, but I also want to make it clear that as Janice has stated, the this is one of the things personnel is not in consensus with, so the board needs to understand that, but it's perfectly acceptable for us to vote on it, so. Yes, Susan. Yeah, could I just clarify, it's my understanding, Janice, would you repeat again the reason you would like to wait on this? I would like to wait on this because the outside of their normal work was not discussed with the MGA, um, and this okay. is not, it was added later. And so um, I just think even if that's where we end up, it it would be worth the time to have that conversation with the MGA. My like, understanding is that we did have that conversation. And it, it, it just. Talked about it in closed session. Yeah, that's my understanding is that, the, no, not for with the oh, board. Oh. My understanding that you talked about it in personnel and that the counter offer was $32, hour, $32 an hour during the, Work day. That's that's my understanding based, but I wasn't at personnel. But that's my understanding based on the last conversation we had about this that it was discussed in personnel. Yep, and I wasn't. That was the last meeting that Philip did. So okay. I, nor was I present at that. Okay. Meeting. It would be helpful to know if this was discussed in personnel, because like I said, my understanding was that it it was, but the counter offer was great, eight for thirty two, but we like to keep the language for. Yeah, it was it was discussed, <clears throat> but I don't think it was resolved. Right, but it's not as if it wasn't presented. No, but all of the other things, uh, I guess I'll say all of the other things that came here, like we kind of came to consensus on with everyone in the room, and this is one that we... The, the last meeting that I was part of, uh, there was quite a bit of discussion, both with the MGEA and within the committee, and um, we... We left unresolved with a myriad of hybrid options and different things on the table. And so that, that's the last thing I was part of was a, an open-ended discussion. Right. But we don't have to bargain this, right? This is for us to decide. It would seem to me, I mean, what is the detrimental effect of waiting until the December meeting to make the decision on this and, and at least making the attempt to have further discussion, then then you can come to the board and say, we went back and had further discussion on it. We still are not in consensus. 
but we're going to vote now. This at least gives you an opportunity to take one more shot at it and then still come back and make the same action. Um, if we took, if we moved on this tonight and approved it, effectively, what's the difference? Except that we'd start, would we start paying them this amount now? We're currently paying this amount because it's in the handbook as it stands during the school day. Continues to be to take it back and have discussion. Yeah. But I, I think it has to be clear. Well, that I, I guess that I would just. We aren't opposing it. Anybody is welcome no. to call the motion to vote. I will not, but everybody else is willing to do it. I know what where I stand, but um, if one month, you know, giving people a chance to gather and and have a conversation about it, I mean, I'm okay with that. I feel like if people feel like they um, get to be part a seat at the table, I'm okay with that. All right, uh, I will take that back to personnel and discuss it. And I will, uh, I would like the board to be ready to vote either way. At yeah, the next we'll table board to, meeting. We'll table to December. So we'll give it the discussion for another um, couple weeks. And uh, we certainly will um, look into it and I will report back. And I'm hoping that the personnel committee come to consensus. We might not, but. We'll give it a little extra time. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. And then we'll um, table it until December. All right. Okay. Um, support. Oh, this is you again. Yep. It's going to be a oh, lot this of This really meetings. is like the yeah, Eric Hart. it is. Yep. Action items. Uh, support Eric staff Hart. handbook revisions. Um, again, I want to just make sure I... We thank Philip as well, because we we're both part of this. Um, so uh, these are revisions that uh, we found agreement with, that we thought we would uh, have consensus from the personnel committee that we can come to the board for a vote. In our meet and confer meetings, there certainly are other things that we will continue to discuss. But right now, these are some of the changes that we have. And I'll briefly go over those with you. One of them is with paid vacation. <clears throat> um, Annual vacation regular employees shall be entitled to annual pay vacations hereafter provided in the section of the handbook. Um, this section um, has the number of years worked. One year, four year, it was 12 and 16. The changes are changing the 12 to 8 and the 16 to 12. Um, and then there is one under breaks. Employees who work for four or more consecutive days shall be entitled to one 15-minute break in their schedules or hours. Employees who work seven or more hours shall be entitled to the second 15-minute paid break. Breaks shall not be scheduled at the beginning or end of an employee's shift without the employee's agreement. That is being stricken. And then there's a miscellaneous one that says employers shall provide an application for reimbursement of personal items damaged, destroyed by students, during the employees assigned duties. This is something we discussed as a board. And after speaking with Tanya and Kristen, I felt there was too many insurance liabilities with this, that it was something at this time that we would be able to support. So any questions about those? Okay. Questions? Can I get a motion, please? Oh, mm. okay. No, go ahead, James. I think there will still need to be some discussion about um, the things that have been stricken in yellow. Yeah, and I, I just want to clarify that our meet and confer meetings are going to be ongoing. So just because something is stricken now, it doesn't mean that it won't be brought up again in the future. We just have some consensus on some areas that we thought it was important to vote on to, to make some progress. So any one of these things can likely come back at some point. Thank you, Janice, yeah. for, for clarifying that. Yeah, and the the adjustment to the vacation days, like the accrual of leave, is is really important. So appreciation about that. I move approval of the 2024-2025 support staff handbook revisions as presented. Second. Okay, any further discussion? 
All right. Roll call vote. Rochelle? Aye. Philip? Aye. Eric? Abstain. Janice? Aye. Susan? Aye. Elizabeth, aye. Ayes have it. Motion carries. Next up, the Monona Grove School District three-year library plan. I think, Eric, you are off, and Lisa is on. Actually, oh, it's not yeah. Lisa. Um, Welcome. Um, so every uh, three years, there needs to be a revision to the library plan. Uh, so Chad and Heather are here tonight. I'll let them introduce you, themselves and share their roles. Um, are here to talk about looking backwards, uh, what has been achieved, and looking forward, what the plan is. And so then we would be looking for approval of that, um, as we do need to then in December submit it to the Department of Public Instruction. So I'm going to turn it over to the two of you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Chad Klepoth. I'm the uh, technology coordinator for the school district. And I'm Heather McIntosh. I am the uh, high school librarian. So uh, kind of as Tanya had mentioned um, years ago, um, there used to be a standalone uh, library plan for school districts. Um, and as technology uh, plans became more prevalent, library plans sort of got interwoven within those. Um, a few years ago, the DPI sort of sunsetted the technology plan, the district technology plan with the evolution of technology. And from that, um, the library plan became standalone as, again. So um, we're here to just kind of talk a little bit about what that planning looks like um, and what we will submit to uh, the Department of Public Instruction. So the first couple of sides are, are pretty basic. They're just um, a lot of re-rounding in our school district, our mission and vision, um, equity statement, um, and we can just keep going through here. I mean, I think we can all read these. We all are pretty good at uh, um, what's in here. Um, and so a little bit of background again, the district um, the student population within, within each one of our schools. The our school district employs three and a half certified librarians um, and three full-time library e uh, EAs within our school district. So um, the, the background for this plan really is based on, uh, in my previous life, I actually worked for the Department of Public Instruction um, and helped to de develop the Wisconsin Digital Learning Plan, which was based upon Future Ready Framework. And so the, the basis for this plan really focuses in on that. And so the idea behind the Digital Learning Plan is it kind of comp compartmentalizes uh, the major aspects of strategic planning within a school district. Um, there's some kind of big buckets that um, are within that that we can leverage to um, really focus our planning. And at the end of the day, that middle circle is student learning because that's really what we're in the business for. Um, and so all of these pieces support what we do, and that's provide uh, learning opportunities for our kids. And so um, we were able to use that to then develop uh, roles within that. And one of those is a future ready, ready librarian. And so that's kind of um, the focus for this uh, planning going ahead. So we kind of took this and broke it down uh, piece by piece to kind of pull out some of the things that are happening. And then Heather will take over and talk a little bit more in depth about the plan. So the first one here is uh, curriculum instruction. Um, so library media so, uh, staff um, support teachers and students with resources, tools, and access to content. Um, library media specialists um, they select uh, and maintain robust, robust collections in their libraries. They support learners uh, with accessing technology. Um, they're fantastic boots on the ground, uh, working with students and teachers on a daily basis in the buildings. Um, and they're collaborating with instructional partners, um, helping teachers uh, find ways to integrate technology in, in different tools within their uh, learning um, environments um, to really engage and enhance the learning that's happening in our classrooms. The next wedge is personalized professional learning. Um, library media specialists uh, develop and lead professional learning within the buildings. Uh, they take opportunities during PDAs to, to lead uh, some of those um, sessions. They attend uh, professional development when uh, that presents itself and bring that back to, the, to those meetings and to their buildings to help uh, inform um, what they're doing with the, with the teachers and students in their classrooms. Um, and then, go ahead. And keep going. Uh, next wedge, uh, robust infrastructure. Um, we are a one-to-one -one school district. Um, we do have um, iPads, uh, pre-K2, and 312, we have Chromebooks. Um, so we leverage Seesaw at the elementary level. That is our learning management system that we're using for 
um, really day-to-day -day operations in our classroom, and it's presenting assignments, turning in assignments, and really communicating with parents on a daily basis. Uh, secondary schools, so the middle and the high school, use Canvas as their learning management system for a lot of the same things. A lot of the curriculum, a lot of the lessons and things that are um, done are driven through those uh, platforms. Um, and the library media specialists stay current with that, the emerging technologies, and are able to support with the, the programming and, and assignments and things that go through there. The next is budget and resources, um, strategic use of common school funds. Um, they're leveraging those in, in uh, creative ways to support all learners in our schools, as well as for teachers uh, to buy resources that they need to support the learning that's happening, not only in the libraries, but also in classrooms um, across our buildings. Um, and they're using those funds also to, to curate those um, culturally relevant collections in their libraries. Uh, community partnerships. Um, we are partnering with the Monona Public Library, Cottage Grove Library um, to expand our services and uh, be able to make those connections to our community and, and um, find ways in which we can uh, mimic what's happening in, in both places and extend the learning from our schools into those libraries. And then data and privacy, uh, digital citizenship, that's a huge part, uh, push for this year. Um, we are spending a lot of time um, on focusing on what it means to be a digital citizen um, and how we can uh, use some of that in, in the lessons and, and some of the things that we're doing in classrooms. The uh, library media specialists are working with teachers and students, um, focusing on ways that they can be um, digital citizens. Um, the Student Data Privacy Consortium is actually in process of being uh, redone right now, but it's a, a fantastic um, collection of vetted resources that schools can use um, in, in a way that uh, protects the information that they're collecting from, from our students. Um, and then Go Guardian is what we use for a filter in our school district. Um, it it uh, allows us to filter the content that kids are able to access, but then also um, gives us an opportunity um, at the admin level to um, just make sure the things that they are searching are appropriate. Um, collaborative leadership, um, quarterly. So library media specialists meet quarterly um, with uh, myself and with Lisa um, to talk through uh, planning for the years and you know what things are going on and how we can continue to support that and, and needs um, across our schools. Um, when possible, they're attending, library media specials are attending C3 meetings. Um, secondary staff are collaborating with departments, um, content uh, specific projects, um, and uh, elementary schools are running lessons out of their library for, for classrooms. And use of space and time, again, we talked a little bit about um, collaborating with the local libraries um, and using our facilities for uh, some extended space, but also um, a lot of our schools have have uh, maker spaces in there where it gives provides opportunities for kids to kind of get creative and learn um, in a lot of different ways. Um, they're not just sitting in a classroom and getting the information or sitting on a computer and, and um, working through um, normal classroom activities. They, they're doing hands-on um, activities and, and uh, library media specialists are, are helping staff those as well. Um, so now I will turn it over to Heather and she can talk a little bit more about the action plan. Um, yes, I, hopefully you all can hear me. Um, so I, thanks again for having me, Heather McIntosh. Um, so this kind of started with the librarian team uh, coming together and as Chad just walked us through sort of our current state of where we are with this uh, framework for future ready librarians. And as you can see, looking at the framework, um, the librarian position is a very dynamic role within the school and we sort of have, uh, we have access to a lot, of, um, a lot of different pieces and we can support students and teachers and staff and we can support them in lots of different ways. Um, if you wanna move to the next slide, thank you, sorry. Um, so we decided, given that whole wheel and all of the things that we could focus on, we decided to, for this first um, three-year plan, we wanted to focus on curriculum, instruction, and assessment, and then also community partnerships as our focus for our goals for this three-year plan. Um, and we, oh, you, just stay there for one second, sorry. <laughs> um, 
we feel like we are sort of uniquely positioned to uh, act and to have some impact in these two areas. Um, the first off is with what Chad mentioned with our maker spaces. We have an opportunity to extend learning and push learning even further with asking students to come in and collaborating with teachers and building those partnerships with teachers so that students are coming in and using and creating and you know getting, in, getting involved with inquiry and really taking their learning as far as it will go for each individual student. So um, then also community partnerships. We really want to leverage the relationships that we have with our local librarians and especially in Cottage Grove with the supporters of the Cottage Grove Library. So we really want to be able to promote, like cross-promote um, library programming that we are doing and that the public library is doing so that we can offer access to uh, everyone in our community. Um, so that, those are our two areas. And then we'll get to the next slide, and this will outline our specific goals. So we've, we've broken our goals down into the secondary, which would be the middle school and high school, and then elementary. So the secondary, you can see that by the end of the 2024-25 school year, the librarian will have co-planned and executed one unit per quarter at a minimum with a department or grade level team. And we varying those departments or grade levels quarterly. Each unit will both support content area standards and then the Wisconsin Information and Technology Literacy Standards. So we're sort of cross-promoting the learning. Um, the goal will extend through the life of the plan, so that will reach a minimum of 12 co-planned units. And those co-planned units will be either myself teaching or the teacher teaching or us co-teaching, either in classroom or in uh, the library space or both. Um, and then in the elementary, we really want to establish a baseline for the collaborative programs that are happening between our school libraries and our public libraries. Because that's, that's an area that the elementary schools want to push further. And so we want this, this plan this year will sort of set a baseline for us so we know where we are. And then we have, from there, we can decide um, to increase, like how we want to increase that collaboration by 10% each year. And then the makerspace, this is a district-wide goal of using our makerspace, again, to collaborate with our public libraries and with our community so that we can either bring more people into the school or we can go outside of the school to promote inquiry and learning. Um, the next slide, I think, is our timeline. So last year was our planning year, and this was a, this was a pro we planned this as a department, as a team, so all of our librarians were a part of this. Chad was a part of this, and Lisa as well. Um, then we are currently in year one, so this is our implementation year. Um, we'll be collecting data and looking at where we are and where we're going, and then next year will be year two. We'll reflect, see what progress we've made, um, hopefully assess our impact, and then continue pushing forward, making any necessary changes, and then year three will be final reflection, um, analysis, and then starting to develop our next three-year plan. And that's it. Thank you so much. Questions or comments? Sure. Questions. Yes, Janice. <laughs> um, so first of all, this is a lot, and it's really, that's very impressive, and um, I've seen the makerspace and all the cool things. I guess one question I have is we just lost our Glacial Drumlin librarian, so like how is that going to impact this plan? Well, at this, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you want to speak I to think, that. I mean, I think it's hard to say at this point until we have somebody else in place and it, what the what that process looks like. I don't know if, if Lisa can talk to her, if Tanya can talk about it, but... Um, I, I mean, I think I can just share, right? I mean, as, as much as this plan uh, will impact all of our schools, uh, we also have to be um, responsive to the current realities. This was created before our resignation. Uh, we do have someone, um, we do have that position posted currently. I think it closes on Friday. Uh, we will continue to be responsive as we see what happens from that. So we just, we have to make a plan 
uh, with the best of intentions, but then we also have to be able to be responsive to whatever that current reality is, um, even if it was unanticipated. Do you have any follow-ups, Janice? Um, no. Not about that. I mean, I, I will just say I'm sad that we lost her because she taught me to use Canvas over Zoom during COVID. And I saw her with kids later, and she was amazing. So I'm very sad that she's no longer uh, in our district because she was awesome. <clears throat> yes, Susan. My question is, I think, similar to Janice's in that um, you have 3.5 and then 3.0, and that's the staffing that you think is adequate to implement this plan. Is that part of your thought? I, uh, well, I, we, we did start, we did develop this plan last year before we knew what staffing levels were going to be this year. And then I, I don't know what staffing levels will be next year. Um, I mean, we are we are hoping for changes, but we'll just wait and see what happens. And, and yeah, we and can I always just share, like, the goals of this plan around uh, how we can uh, have more community contacts, more partnerships. Uh, it's all about the prioritization of the work. So um, when we have looked at our our library uh, staff and how they use their time, sometimes it's in library lessons. Sometimes it is doing other things in the school, and maybe some of those other things uh, shift if these are our priorities. So it's all about you know where we're putting our time and effort and best utilizing our staff. Hold on a second, Janice. I just yeah, want to yeah, make sure yeah. go for Rochelle it. or Philip or yeah. Eric. Do you have a question? Before you go again. I'll, yeah, I'll hop in after you. All right, go ahead, Philip. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, in this plan, um, can you highlight, uh, are there things that are relatively new that this plan is laying out, you know, compared to what we're doing today? And then are there things that we're, we're just amplifying with this plan? Or I guess, kind of help me understand to what degree is this a, a sure. shift in direction, a partial shift the in direction? The community are probably the thing that's most, um, uh, I'm going to say new, yeah. in this, mm -hmm. um, that we uh, that, that need to continue that outreach, uh, particularly in a community that doesn't have a standalone library right now. So library programming has to look a little different in the Cottage Grove community. Um, and we have done some things like bookmobiles and things like that with our staff that have been really successful. But uh, how we can continue to grow that so that students are fostering uh, their love of reading and also like have access to not only like library programming, but the idea with the maker space as well, which is just a, a really wonderful outlet for students to kind of be creative and innovative, um, see how things work, put things together. Uh, that doesn't always happen in a normal course of a day. Um, so maker space isn't new in our district. It's something we have put a lot of time and effort into in each of our, our schools. But I think the expansion of that into maybe some more of that community programming is a, a new aspect of the work. Um, but also even monitoring at like some of our, our schools how often the maker space lessons and or um, actual physical space is, is utilized. We'd like to get more of a firm grasp on that. And that's where the language around a baseline and then seeing how we grow from there. Because we do think that that is really valuable learning. And when you look at the ITL standards around empowering learners and that sort of fostering like creativity um, and curiosity, those are things that we, we believe are important. Thank you. Rochelle. Um, thank you for being a, a, a one of our librarians. I. I had gotten to be the parent volunteer at Winnequa when my kiddo was there. And then I started subbing because I was already there all the time volunteering. And so then I got to be the go-to library sub, which was my favorite. So I got to really spend a lot of time seeing how the library was used and how the lessons were really beautifully integrated. And so... Um, I think that this is this is our big picture, our goal, and it will get reassessed. It, it's already in the plan and and adjusted where it needs to be. But I think this is a great 
starting point for these three years. Back to you, Janice. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm one of those people who likes to know, like, how is it going to work? So I know that when I was teaching, we would send people with kids with Chromebook issues to the, like, IMC to get that taken care of. Like, is is the are the librarians still doing that, or is somebody else going to be doing that? Because this seems to be, like, a lot of things that are all super really cool. Oh, yeah. We still do that, and we still do all the other super cool things. We're kind of... We're doing it all, um, and I can, I can only speak for the for the high schools. I can't speak for the for the elementary or the high school, um, but yeah, this is this is like one part of the job that I do. And then there's just there's so much more that happens. And yeah, kids come in every day, multiple times over and over to and have we, us help with all their technological needs. Yeah, but I think with those we try to minimize touch time for kids. <laughs> when those devices come in, we have loaners in the libraries, and they're swapping out, and we're recording, and then. Um, our team can pick those up and, and make sure that we make any anything. So hopefully that's not taking a ton of time to be able to do that. I know at the elementary, they take a little bit of time to, to help put in a tech, a tech ticket, whereas the high school, they're, we're trying to get them to do, the, the kids to do them on their own. But, uh, but, we're, but we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, they're, they're doing fantastic. Well, thank you. And just getting to see, like, last fall, the high school and all the things going on in the library, it, it was amazing. So... You are all welcome anytime. We would love to have you come in and just see what we're doing and hang out with the kids. And yeah, it'd be great. I have a, a couple of comments and a question. My first comment is um, I think our all of our library media specialists are amazing. And I think that um, I would invite folks to go and kind of see it and experience it. I think it's um, one of those things where like kind of like if you have like old school thought about like what a librarian, right? It's like more like static, like I hang and then you ask me about books and I look it up on the Dewey Decimal and I go and do the thing. But the way that our library media specialists really like know the kids, understand their interests, like add in, I mean, everything from stop motion animation and podcasting and just like the, the variety of things and the depth with which they understand not only their subject matter, but also just understand the kids is, is incredible. So I just wanted to say that I think it's, it's amazing what you all do in terms of this type of programming and the technology pieces. Um, the other – the question that I had is mostly for you, Chad, I think, around like just managing screen time in general, right? So I, I understand technology infrastructure is an important wedge, right, in this plan but also just like in life in general. Um, but thinking about how we're monitoring and managing, you know, the use of – iPad, Chromebooks for learning versus other opportunities for learning when it's collaborative versus when it's static, those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, I guess that comes down to the classroom level. I mean, we um, we are so, I mean, we're really hyper-focused on making sure that the technology is working and that, you know, teachers have it when they need it in order to support the learning that's happening in the classrooms. And I think um, really at the classroom level, that's, that's where that screen time comes into play. I know that this year there was a, a book that came out all about screen time. And um, we, we, in my research when, when we were doing this um, in the past, um, screen time was always a conversation. And I think um, our teachers do a pretty good job of, of managing when they're, you know, it's not um, using a, a piece of technology in a purposeful way isn't taking the worksheet that we used to do and digitizing it and now we're filling it out on a computer and we're using computers. That's that's not at all. It's really uh, an extension and enhancement of a uh, learning opportunity um, in that sense. Yeah, and if I can speak to that too. Um, I mean, that's part of what I, that's part of what I do in particular at the high school is try and try and sort of find, vet, research any of those tools that might help to enhance collaboration. Like we don't just want students sitting on Chromebooks just by themselves. Like so, you know, I'm working with teachers to use Cami for one. That's a program that we have, which can be very collaborative and very interactive. Um, Canvas is a very robust learning management system. So I'm working with teachers to, to have them use Canvas to its fullest and do collaboration pieces there. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of ever evolving and you really have to stay on top of it in order to 
um, keep pace with what is going to work best in the classroom, and that's really a big part of our jobs too. Yeah, and I would I would also highlight makerspaces again because there are parts of technology in makerspaces, but there's a lot of building, a lot of hands-on learning, a lot of yeah. I mean, kids are curators and creators, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, if you go into one of those, make, there's blocks everywhere, there's Legos, there's, you know, lots of, you know, different types of kits, and there is some technology involved, but, but it is also sometimes a brain break. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I can say I did not plan this, but I want to get my uh, plug for my computer, and this was uh, my Makerspace gift today. So there you go. It's, <laughs> it got stuck in my thing. So, um, I, I think that that, I think it's, I think it's great. I'm really excited to see where this goes. I'm really excited about the community engagement. I know in Cottage Grove, I feel like, um, there's been a lot of really great opportunities for, um, the Friends of Cottage Grove Library to do programming. It's always been a little unclear to me how much of that is like truly collaborative versus this is, library programming that happens to be housed in Granite Ridge, right, because they don't have a space. And so thinking about that intentional connection, um, I think will really, it'll be mutually reinforcing to both programs, right, um, which is always a good thing for, for kids and families. So thanks for everything that you do. I cannot speak more highly of our library staff. They're fantastic and amazing, and it makes me want to go back to elementary school. <laughs> no offense to the secondary. I just haven't expo gotten exposed to them yet. Other questions or thoughts? I move approval of the MGSD three-year library plan as presented. Second. Great. Any further discussion? Okay. We'll do a voice vote for this one. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. I look forward to hearing your progress. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I believe this is you, Mr. McGrath. 2025-2026 new course proposals. Right, we have uh, two new course proposals for next year. Can you hear me? Yeah, just two this year. Usually, there's. Um, and they're both in family consumer sciences. One is our exploring hospitality course. Uh, we would like this to be seen as a capstone course. So after students have taken culinary one, culinary two, baking and pastries, this would be a capstone experience for them. Wouldn't have to be. Could be just a student that's interested in um, the Exploring Hospitality course. It's, it would be a dual credit course with Madison College, so there's that advantage, too, for a junior or senior if they want to jump into the hospitality um, coursework at that point. Um, give students uh, it lists 11 exciting units in the uh, course proposal and uh, give students an opportunity to dig a little more deeply into the content area standards that are listed there as well. Um, the Family Consumer Science second course that's proposed is Nutrition. That again would be for juniors and seniors. Um, this would allow them to go more deeply into the uh, health sciences standards listed in the proposal. And again, they have, um, I think they have 11 exciting units proposed as well for the Nutrition course. Um, this was a course that was brought to us after uh, several years of growing interest in uh, the nutrition unit in the um, in the uh, sports. What class was it? Yeah, the sports medicine class. I wanted to say sports nutrition, but that would be redundant. <laughs> sports medicine class, um, and uh, so we're excited to offer that to students as well. The last um, request there is not a new course as much as a revision, and that is uh, asking to be able to deliver that capstone experience in our world language area um, using the AP offering as well as the college credit and high school offering that we currently use with our dual credit partnership with UW Green Bay. Thanks, Mitch. Questions or comments? Yes, Susan. The only question I have, and, and again, Mitch, I'm sure you've already looked at this, um, but when we made some changes in the middle school curriculum, one of the things, one of the questions we didn't ask was, um, how would this affect current programming? Um, and in terms of, would it change any of the other programs do you have to make space for these programs 
by deleting any other programs? We had that conversation with the department in terms of um, our current enrollment. Um, a little bit limited with the kitchen in terms of how much we're going to grow in the culinary areas where we use the kitchen. And so these are both exciting classes that are offered outside of the kitchen. Um, the other courses, it's hard to predict with enrollment, but uh, with the capstone course particularly, we'd like to prioritize that if we possible and, and start to grow that course. Uh, we have a lot of courses at the same level right now, and this would be a course that, as I said, is more of a capstone experience at the end of your your uh, your hospitality experiences there. So you make it work. We make it work. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, Selena. For languages, would there be no more Spanish five, no more French five, but we just have AP Spanish and Fr AP French instead then? So this would this would give permission to offer AP French instead of the um, yep instead of the French five with uh, college credit and high school experience. So they both be that fifth year of French. Mm -hmm. It's just are you is it labeled AP or is it labeled that college um, credit and high school experience? What are the risks and benefits to that? Yeah. To, Thanks. The content really stays at that level five level. It's mainly a, a semantic change in the name, saying AP uh, Spanish or AP French versus this um, college credit in high school program. That requires a certification of the instructor to have a master's in that language. And sometimes we have that available, and sometimes we don't. And if we don't, we don't want our students to lose out on what could be a credit-bearing experience, and AP would allow that. <clears throat> so, so that's sort of the technical aspect to it, but the level five experience students would have in either language would maintain that still that same level of rigor. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Now, Lena kind of asked mine, so. <laughs> I, just have, I just have one around whether or not this new nutrition course is an opportunity to do some collaboration with, like, our food and nutrition staff as, like, our internal subject matter experts on nutrition in the district. Definitely a possibility there. Um, as I said in the course uh, description there, um, you know, case studies was also a, a piece. And yeah. so pulling in, playing in expertise and partnering with people available as part of that. I couldn't just, I sent you a um, request for that because I couldn't access that oh. link. I got denied. But don't worry. When you're back at your computer, you can <laughs> give me access. All right, if there are no further questions, can I get a motion, please? I move approval of the 2025-2026 new course proposals as presented. Second. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll do voice vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Eyes have it. Motion carries. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you. All right. Last action item that we have is the 2024-2025 uh, revised board meeting schedule. Um, at a board meeting several months ago, we talked about um, moving to uh, having some meetings in Cottage Grove, which we did last month, had our first meeting in Cottage Grove, which was amazing. Um, but we always adapt our calendar in April, so we need to readjust the calendar for, for Cottage Grove. You'll see what is proposed there. I will share with the board that I did get a request from a board member um, to maintain the December 11th meeting here for scheduling purposes and see if we could move the December Cottage Grove meeting to January instead. Um, it doesn't really make a difference to me, but I just wanted to let you know that that was a request that came in. And um, I my... Teaching schedule next semester is Tuesdays and Thursdays from 5.30 to 8.30. Okay. So um, any Thursday night uh, starting in the middle of January up until May, I will not be available. You know, Tanya, I know that Wednesday didn't work because the um, Villachal is not available, but are were there other days that were available or is it just Thursday? Um, I think they gave us what was available, like, front or back of that date, and so it was Thursdays. Okay. But we could do a Monday, or no? Mm -mm. No. Those were the dates that they gave us that oh. were available. Okay. The, and these are the only dates that are available? During that week. Yeah, 
during the week that we're, we're looking at? Mm -hmm. So again, I, I, I would minimally request that, again, just because of scheduling for December, that we would hold the Wednesday meeting. Um, because again, we're going to have to get some policy things done. And um, I already have scheduled meetings in Chicago. And I actually omitted the Wednesday night so I could be here. Um, and I would be unavailable for Thursday night. And I can't do it virtually. Yeah, so, Eric? I would also be unavailable on the 12th. OK. Um, I, I have concerns with the fact that if we have a standing board meeting that one of our board members just can't attend because of other obligations. And so to me, I like would like to discuss that. I think it's one thing to be like, you know, things come up, right? And you have to miss a meeting here or there. But I feel like it does our board a disservice and certainly, you know, you a disservice, Rochelle, to not be able to participate. And so um, I'm a little uncomfortable with the schedule as presented uh, because it, like, excludes one of our board members from the beginning of the year until basically like the end of the school year. Well, it'd be two because I can't do Thursdays. Oh, you can't either. do Thursdays either? No, I cannot. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm curious for how the rest of the board feels. To me, it, it feels to me irresponsible for us to adopt a schedule where we have known board members that consistently cannot make those dates. Uh, I agree. Yeah. Could, so maybe if possible, we could maintain our current schedule and continue to negotiate with the village board in terms of timing, understanding that they've only offered those dates to us. But I, I, I appreciate that, Susan. I do want to acknowledge the fact that I think Tanya and probably you, Katie, too, to a certain extent, have done a lot of um, back and forth. And I'm wondering if maybe this is something where, because I, I thought, I, I think it's really nice to have meetings in Cottage Grove. I love that space. It was amazing. And I wonder if this is something with a little bit more planning that we could build in the schedule kind of at reorg. And so rather like keeping the schedule as is, like, or as we originally did it now, which means we'd stay in Monona the rest of this kind of board cycle, but that knowing that we're going to reorg in April, we're going to reschedule all of our meetings, and that maybe gives Tanya and Katie time to work with the village to be able to say, okay, moving forward for this next board cycle, what are some options? Um, I'm hesitant to have them go back and continue to try to, like, find a date or a date or a date, and then it becomes a little ad hoc, which I think, as we've already found out, is difficult for people's consistent schedules. So my that would be my recommendation, um, and I'm curious what other board members would think about that. No, I, I agree. Um, I'm also curious, uh, given more time to chew on the problem, is are there other things that we would consider, like one of our school buildings in Cottage Grove? Are there any spaces that, you know, we can't make work on short term, but, you know, six months down the road or seven months down the road, our potential? Yeah, um, we would have to make an investment into... Um, technology, which I just don't think we're in a spot to do to right stream, now right. Mm -hmm. in order yeah. to stream um, and use the Monona um, municipality channel that the way we have it set up. So. Uh, I, I agree with leaving it the way it is this year and kind of working towards potentially having, you know, like half our meetings in Cottage Grove, if that can be achieved next year, that would be a really good thing because I did like the one time that we met there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, we can't not have people who just consistently can't be here. That's not fair. And we already set a schedule. Is there any, would there be any value in surveying the community to, to make sure that we're not chasing a, you know, an empty thing here? I'm just, that just, just occurs to me. We, we had the one meeting in Cottage Grove and I think two people showed up. Um, I just want to make sure we don't overextend our effort and then have a bunch of meetings with nobody there, one person, you know. Um, should we ask if people actually find value in us doing this? Well, I would just say the board discussed this and all voted on it. So you I'm know, totally in favor of it. I, I know we, clear. We, I just, we, yeah. we voted on it, right? So we discussed it. 
obviously, you know, when you make changes, you don't anticipate certain things like, well, Wednesday, what if Wednesdays aren't available? And then you have to do another day and two board members can't attend because they have their Wednesdays blocked off. That's a, just a, you know, a circumstance of doing that. But I guess um, I would, since the board discussed and voted on having meetings there, I'd like to make a commitment that we're going to try to have meetings there maybe after the reorg meeting. Um, and that gives other, you know, everybody a time that maybe they, but they, those meetings can't be on Wednesdays. So we can pre-plan and know what that day is going to be, whether it's a Thursday or Monday. At least the board has a chance to discuss that in case you have to teach or I have, you know, the kids on Thursday night or whatever. Um, so, um, uh, that that I would feel more comfortable about that. I, I mean, obviously, these two are just not going to be possible just because of circumstances, not because we don't want to do them or commit to what we voted for. So, to clarify, I fully support meeting in Cottage Grove. I have no no objection. I think it's a great idea. I just don't want to invent problems to solve if they're not even. Yeah. The rest of the staff are busy enough, so I just that that the only reason I brought it up was. You know, we can you know, obviously chase any sort of solution we want to to problems we come up with. But yeah, it, it it just sounds like there's good, strong general consensus and support for trying to have every other meeting in Cottage Grove. But right now, the facility isn't available on the evenings when the board can attend, and I don't think we can schedule board meetings knowing that two of the board members are going to be unable to attend. Um, so at least for right now, again, I, I would support maintaining the current schedule and continuing to investigate site availability and maybe talking to Will about... When we were in the libraries, what we were doing, we couldn't do it live, but we, we actually, our people tape the programs. So again, looking at the pros and cons. Yeah. Okay, so what I am hearing is that we will maintain the original schedule that we had voted on back in April, which means that the rest of our meetings will be here at the district office. Um, but Tanya, if you and Katie could work with the village as we move into the April reorg, when we need to relook at the calendar um, and see whether or not we can find some opportunities on like a Monday or a Tuesday. Basically, like Thursday sounds like no go. Well, for now. <laughs> well, for this semester <laughs> yeah, at least, yeah, right? Yeah. And so I think that if that sounds good to everybody, then. Well, procedurally, we would have to make an amendment to the schedule and vote on it then because we previously voted on that we would meet in Cottage Grove. So we would need to make, we would need to adjust that, I think. We vote on the. A finalized schedule, though? Yeah, well, we voted. Uh, we didn't vote on a finalized schedule, but we voted on the dates. Oh, that's right. So, oh, go ahead, Tish. Okay. Oh, if possible. Well, I think I mean, to make you, it clean, we should, yeah. we, should, there, we should amend that on the current schedule. I'll do it. Okay, yeah, I was going to say, do you want to make a yep, motion to? Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm first going to make a motion to amend the regular meeting schedule as presented. I think you could probably just reinstate the original calendar, like move to reinstate the original calendar from the April meeting, as opposed to like amending and going. I don't understand, because to change the current schedule, we have to approve this. You can just vote nay on this. And be done. So the current schedule is maintained unless you change it. So as long as we don't act on this, the current schedule would be maintained, correct? I, I think Eric's concern is that we did have a vote around and did some agreed upon dates. dates. So we, we actually did approve a new schedule mm -hmm. when we were first talking about this. Yeah, that's exactly what we did. Yeah, I yeah. remember. And so our, our if we if this stand if we don't, even if we don't vote on this, like we can vote this down, but that Old, that schedule that we voted on no previously valid. will be the default, which doesn't work. And so we have to go back to we have to go back to the original schedule. Which meeting did we vote? Yeah, uh, I don't think we had specific date. We did. It? Yeah, we did. Pull it up. I think it was the September meeting. Yeah. 
Yeah, because I think, Eric, you went through kind of I did. Lined it. Yep. Popping in and out. Well, I have to, it keeps jumping off my hotspot back on it and tries to use the Wi Fi, and then I have to switch. I think it was. Yeah. October 30th. Yeah, I think it was. But it's this is easy to fix. It's yeah. not that difficult to fix. Okay. We just have to. Um, Nothing's really easy to fix, but. Mm -hmm. I don't think it has to be that complicated, I guess, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the revised, the motion on hand is to move approval of revised 24-25 um, revised board education meeting schedule as presented. Um, but I am going to make a motion to vote on the revised Monona Grove School District Board of Education meeting schedule um, as presented with the changes of Wednesday, December 11th, regular board meeting in Monona, and Wednesday, February 12th, regular board meeting in Monona, and Wednesday, April 16th, regular board meeting in Monona. Striking Thursday, December 12th, regular board meeting in Cottage Grove and striking Thursday, February 13th, regular board meeting in Cottage Grove and Thursday, April 17th, regular board meeting in Cottage Grove. Did you get that, Tish? Okay. <laughs> I can help you with it after the meeting, too. I'll, I'll second that. Great. Any further discussion? Okay, let's do voice vote. Did, did I get that right? Right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. All right. Um, next. We're still meeting on Wednesday the 11th. We're st yeah. yeah. Basically, we're going, we're going back, back to, to the, the regular schedule, schedule, but it's just yeah. you voted on it. So. Wanted to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, as we get closer to reorg, it'll be, it'll be good to have some proposed dates for that meeting in April. Um, all right, so next is uh, informational items, which is standing committees, um, personnel, policy, and MGEF. I'll, I'll met. I don't know, Eric, if you have any additional things you want to share about personnel. No, I'll just update. Personnel is working on the para um, bargaining schedule as well as building services bargaining schedule. We have two meetings scheduled. Um, I need to discuss this with personnel. They may or may not be happening. We have one on the 18th for the teachers. We need to decide if we want to keep that meeting. We have one on 12th with um, uh, the meet and confer with special ed assistance. Uh, so I, I envision those will change somewhat. Um, and our hope is to work on the bargainings um, for those two units and get that to the board by the next uh, board meeting in December. Uh, Susan, did you have any additional updates from policy other than what we talked about today? Um, nothing new on policy. Okay. How we about... We presented it to the board as... Um, as the first reading. Up to date, yeah. Great. Uh, all right. So then I assume that you have a report for Monona Grove Education Foundation? Yes. The Monona Grove Education Foundation met on the 12th at 4 p.m. Um, the superintendent was not available that day, so there was no superintendent report. Um, and Jason presented the um, donation from Amazon already, so you were able to see that. Uh, they did an update on their endowments, um, $616 to Cottage Grove School, Winnicott Schools endowment is 717 and the high school is 831 Um those are endowments based on the um, account that each school has and the interest that is earned during that year. The update on the CARES campaign, uh, the um, total for 2024 is $42,903.61. Uh, committee reports, grants and awards, um, there was a $100 for food uh, for students at MG21. For Play It Forward, um, there was a high school request for um, $700, uh, and that was approved. Um, 
communications. There, Kerry Robbins is doing recognition of participation in the homecoming parade, uh, the weekend snack pack. Um, there was an award from American Family, a grant of $2,500. Um, and uh, Jason would like to make sure that everyone is aware that the student applications for scholarships for the Monona Grove Education Foundation scholarships starts December 1. So, and confirming their next meeting is December 10th at 4 p.m. Thank you, mm -hmm. All right, last item is the superintendent report. Yes, just a couple updates. Um, we did have uh, voting in the last election. Um, in the village of Cottage Grove, a Granite Ridge School was used. Um, we worked collaboratively with the Cottage Grove Police Department. Um, the building is set up in a nice way that you can uh, corridor off the doors, so you can't go between the gym and the rest of the building. Um, nevertheless, I think we did have some staff and some families who were concerned. Um, we did have the school resource officer spent his uh, day um, he swept the building before voting started, you know, was in and out, did some of those things. Uh, Village of Cottage Grove did make sure that um, they had officers in and out of the parking lot um, just to create that safe presence. Um, there's some things we can do with recess and things in the future if we continue to have um, voting in the schools. I know it's a lovely space. It just feels in conflict um, with some of, the, some of the things we think about from school safety. Um, we did put out a family and staff survey about calendar considerations for the school year calendar for 25, 26, and 26, 27. Um, that's been deployed, so um, Katie and her team is working through that to get the feedback. Um, and then we will um, get feedback from um, teachers and groups of people as we put those calendars together. And then um, staff satisfaction survey from the Gallup went out, and that will results will come to personnel in December. Um, and then as associated action plans from a district perspective, um, uh, Kristen and I and the rest of the admin cabinet will go to the buildings and get feedback on, you know, what are, you know, talk about our celebrations, but then also, you know, what are our greatest areas of opportunity and dig a little deeper into that because the, the surveys give you a little bit of information, but it's always great to hear directly from people. Um, and again, you know, these aren't end of ones. We're looking for trend data and really thinking about, um, you know, how we can move forward. Uh, any questions, comments? Um, I just have one, which is thank you for the calendar survey. I think it was really lovely to get to be able to provide some input from a parent perspective around some of the the um, calendar items, and I appreciated like the options too around like if not this, then this. So oh, I just, we do good love a logic survey. Yeah, so good. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say say thank you for that. I think this has yeah. might have been the first time as a parent in the district that anyone asked. Yeah. Me <laughs> yep, we've um, which is just because I complain about it a lot, despite the fact that I approve it. Well, we get a lot of feedback from staff, but we barely ask parents, and so we need to have a more well-rounded perspective um, of what current state of affairs. Yeah. Oh, I felt really good. So thank you for that. I want to say that the staff probably appreciates appreciates it a lot because I don't think there were surveys to staff before either. So, yeah, thank you. Great. Um. The last item on the agenda is future meeting dates. So TLE on November 19th, personnel December 2nd. Um, we have our standing um, Board of Education meeting on December 11th, Wednesday here. Um, and then that will actually take us to the end of 2024, which just feels incredible. But there we are. And we'll probably be adding an FNO committee meeting in December as well. Yes. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Yep. Sounds good. All right. If there's anything else for the good of the group, I will entertain a motion to adjourn, please. I make a motion to adjourn. Okay. Anyway, all those in favor of voice vote say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Ayes have it. Motion carries. Nice job, everybody. Good meeting. <laughs>